uh, I click on it. Okay, I start with uh, Sir Richard Rogers. I kept adding because I had a, I had a, a presentation that I made for him and uh, Norman Foster some time ago, but um, mm. I lost it, and now uh, I had to create one very quickly. Fortunately, I'm I was kind of familiar with his work. But I discovered other works because these people build, uh, build and build and build. They are, they are prolific, yes. Extremely prolific, yes. Mm. Incredible. Anyway, Richard Rogers is actually is a sir and he has a title, Lord of yeah. something. Lord Rogers, yes. Right, he is Lord, uh, Lord, Lord Rogers. Okay, so uh, he's uh, 80 years, 80 something, maybe 80, around 85. He doesn't, he, it's very strange. I read that that he, when he was a child, he couldn't read until he was eleven, and he was uh, not good in school. Uh, the, yeah. the teachers were, you know, <laughs> having troubles with him, and he was very depressed. And this very depressed child who couldn't read until eleven, uh, then later on studied at Yale uh, in the United States and uh, became one of the most uh, celebrated architects. So I regret that there aren't uh, more students here to encourage them that even mm. if they get bad grades, there is still uh, a possibility that they might make it later on in life. Yes. Uh, anyway. These days, I think that uh, the uh, school system is better at recognizing people with dyslexia. That's what he had. Yes. And to provide them with the right support so that they don't end up getting depressed. But uh, quite often these dyslexics have uh, very great talents that are kind of hidden behind their disability. I didn't know this, but um, you know, maybe there is some kind of sense of uh, balance uh, in the world. So if there is yeah. a deficiency, deficiency on one side, maybe, mm. You know, maybe in some cases uh, it is balanced by uh, some brilliance in another in another way. Yeah. Okay. He doesn't look also here. He seems to, <laughs> he seems a, well. He is um, you know a little older, but uh, you know he. I, I actually like him. He's not. He doesn't have really the the happy face of a of a mm. star. You know. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually quite modest, uh, typically. Yeah. Yeah, and this, at least that is my experience, which is a few decades old right now. But uh, no, but I, I'm very much uh, very happy you mentioned this because this mm. was my feeling too. And I will end the presentation with some uh, uh, buildings he built. Uh, in fact, the most recently that he built uh, uh, a few buildings for the homeless and for uh, you know temporary housing. So I like this mm. fact that this 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 gentleman who built. Uh, incredibly complex and uh, you know even for the government and large buildings and he also found so-called found time to 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 think of and work for for those uh, less privileged so yeah. i i think uh, without knowing this i i had a feeling yes he's modest and uh, we can only learn from such someone like this now here <laughs> if you recognize them on the left is sir norman foster and on the right, Sir Richard Rogers, uh, students at Yale. Uh, I guess mm. it was winter, considering how they were dressed, especially mm. Sir Richard Rogers, with that Russian uh, hat okay, yeah. cap on his head. And um, yeah, they were friends, and they even started their first office together, uh, the so-called uh, Team Four. Uh, there were a few more people than four, but essentially they were like uh, ABBA from Sweden. From, from hmm. Sweden that, uh, you know, I did not know that, that these two were in partnership uh, before. Yes, uh, I knew yes. about Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers. Yeah, that and came fact, afterwards. Right. And in fact, in Renzo Piano's office, uh, which I saw many years ago, uh, when you walk in the, in the front, they have a front desk and then on the side wall is a picture and it has Renzo, Norman Foster, and Richard Rogers, all uh, like students with long hair and all that stuff. So yes. I think that even Renzo was part of this little group, uh, certainly when they were studying. 
I'm not sure if it was at Yale or at the Architectural Association. I'm not sure. <clears throat> this this I didn't know, but yes, they these two uh, studied at uh, Yale, and then uh, we'll will 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 go to will arrive at, at that stage in in his development, uh, working with him and their future wives, plus mm. a few other people. That's why I made the reference to that musical group. <laughs> ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> ah, but, because uh, you know it was even called Team Team Four. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, this is a picture of uh, Renzo Piano and, ah, that's right. With, and, uh, uh, yeah. and uh, Richard Rogers on the right. After, uh, you know, gladly, I mean, uh, luckily, or I don't know how to say it. No, I shouldn't say gladly and I shouldn't say luckily. After mm -hmm. they won the competition for Sondre Boburg. Yeah. Sondre well, it was lucky, lucky for both of them because uh, it launched their careers, really. Right. And in mm. what a um, significant way. And I, yeah. I uh, listened to a, an interview with uh, Renzo Piano and he said, when we decided to take part in this competition, we were absolutely sure we were not going to win. So <laughs> we decided to go for it, to truly, yeah. you know, get wild and, 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 mm. and, and make whatever we, we felt was, was, uh, was good. Mm. And they won. And yeah. I keep I, I keep telling the students to do the same, you know, <laughs> take risks. Where your heart is, that's where your project should be. Mm. And uh, don't think about the result because fate, sometimes at least, uh, comes after you uh, smilingly if you turn your back on it. Sometimes. Anyway, mm. here they are. I don't know if in the back is not uh, Peter Rice. Um. Yes, it could be actually. Yes, yeah. that is Peter Rice. Yes. Yes, they they sit on, you know, this uh, structural element of of yeah. Peter Rice was of course, was of course uh, uh, the uh, hmm. implied. I mean, uh, part of the team. I don't yes. know if he was the lead uh, structural engineer. Yes, he was that. very much the uh, structural brain behind this project. And in fact, that element that they are sitting on has a name. It's called a gerberet. <laughs> are you so kind, please, to repeat? Gerberet. G-E-R-B-O-R-E-T-T-E. -E. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I did make a presentation on Peter Rice, um, you know, when on his, on his birthday, actually. Mm. I think it was in May or in June. Uh, I forgot now. Anyway, great, great, great in engineer. And, uh, you know, uh, such a pleasure to see, you know, two brilliant uh, uh, architects with a brilliant uh, engineer. And mm. uh, in this building in particular, the engineer was crucial because it was a building that... Uh, you know, it needed uh -huh. uh, a lot of uh, sophistication in the field of, uh, of engineering. Right. And the, and the unsung hero, who you'll never see his name mentioned anywhere, was Peter Rice's partner, a gentleman called Tom Barker. And Tom Barker was the mechanical engineer for this project. So much of the visible expression on Boborg Yes, you see the structure, but you also see the pipes and the, and the electrical so, cables, yes. all of that. That was Tom Barker. Yes, in this building particularly, the, yeah. uh, the, the mechanical side of, uh, of architecture is, is crucial. Yeah. Yeah, and Mahad, if I was just thinking of Tom, as right as you said that. Ah, uh, okay. And, is that Brucey? Uh, hi there. Hi, Mahad. So <laughs> glad to hear your voice um, and Dan, your voice as well. Uh, just just to add the all the services are different colors right yeah. mechanical what is it's yellow green and blue right blue for mechanical uh and red right yellow and yeah i is think it yellow i think the red is the fire systems the blue red's is the, the mechanical system. the green is the electrical and uh yellow is the plumbing i think great <laughs> but there are a few more colors on the scarf of sir richard rogers on his scarf, yes, for sure, yes. <laughs> anyway. And, and the Gerberet is named after a, an engineer, uh, Gerber, who, um, who had um, invented a system, patented a system of continuous band structures. Ah, okay. I didn't know that. 
Okay, <laughs> so we, we begin with his first, um, you know, firm, uh, Team 4, uh, and uh, I'll show one or two projects. It is impossible, it's impossible to, to, to show all the works because he built uh, enormously, but I'll show two works from this uh, period and um, a few more from other periods. Uh, here, uh, we'll start with this uh, creek, green, uh, corn, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, um, because I kept changing until the last minute, here is a chance to see a photograph, quite a, a, a beautiful photograph with them, very young, the team four. Mm. Of course, there are more than four, but you can see uh, Norman Foster and Richard Rogers and their future wives. R Richard Rogers, I think, married Sue Bramwell, and uh, Norman Foster married uh, Wendy Chisman. But what is mm. strange, in the picture, uh, Richard Rogers seems to uh, hold uh, behind her, you know, uh, uh, the future wife of Norman Foster. That's okay. why I got, I got confused. <laughs> Here they are. Okay. You know, no, the one on the right side of um, uh, Richard Rogers, if I understood correctly, became the wife of uh, Norman Foster. And mm -hmm. the one in between um, Richard Rogers and Norman Foster became the wife of, uh, uh, of uh, Richard Rogers. Okay. Mm. After probably some fight about this uh, photograph. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they are young and you know, they are, it's something, of course we are all nostalgic about the past, but um, mm. uh, we see here, you know, the two very important architects, how they began and uh, you know, mm. it's nice. Anyway, this is the first work from 1966. Uh, and uh, it still stands that the test of time. Not so much this, but there is a small, uh, a, a, if I can call it so, a small part which is uh, partly uh, underground. Um, very, very nice. Hmm. Um, anyway, this one. Oh, this is very clean. Yeah. Yes, that yes, it's very nice. And, one, yeah. uh, very, very nice. And, uh, uh you'll see more pictures of it you see well wow. it's uh, it's really um, a, a nice piece of architecture uh it's a it's you know it's it's a little uh, <laughs> hole in the ground but it mm. has character and it has uh, you know it's 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 uh, I, I i like it it's nice uh, and they did it yeah in 1966 mm. um, you can see here side plan with the big houses and that uh, little uh, addition, if I can call it so. Anyway, and the drawing, I don't know who made the drawing, but it doesn't really matter. Even the section is very nice. It's, um, it's, it's a nice work. And it doesn't matter, I keep telling this to the students, it doesn't matter how big the work or how small, you can bring in quality at all levels. Mm. Um, I didn't say something maybe uh, you need, uh, unexpected, but... Now, uh, this is a factory uh, from 1967, so again, it's Team 4. And even here, you see the, the, the builder, you know, you see someone who is... Uh, uh, who is not playing with forms uh, too much, but thinks about how the building was made. And, uh, and there is some kind of anticipation here for what was to come. And we'll see some great buildings uh, built by uh, Sir Richard Rogers, future Sir Richard Rogers. Mm. Okay, now <clears throat> he formed a partnership with his wife, uh, who, 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 you see, changed her last name to Rogers, but the first name is Sue, and with two other architects, and you'll see um, the Zip Up house. And it's very interesting that from the beginning, Richard Rogers had, uh, had an interest for uh, inexpensive uh, uh, lodgings or dwellings, uh, in this case, uh, prefa prefabricated house. The zip up house was designed between 1967 and 1969 for the House of Today competition, which was sponsored by DuPont. 
the design was for a factory built house, quick to assemble and reassemble with cheap insulation pa uh, panels that are used on refrigeration trucks with rapid construction, all at low cost. Mm. Richard Rogers wrote, buying clothes off the rack is the norm. We wanted to do the same for the house, an affordable, speedy kit of parts. Mm. And this is a model uh, of the house. Um, it's a little bit hard to imagine how you can buy it uh, off the rack, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, easily, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was made of, of parts, so you will see a drawing showing uh, how it might have been assembled. But it shows his uh, uh, concern for, for practicality. And he was actually, despite the fact that he's considered a high-tech architect, uh, uh, he had an interest from the very beginning in what is called sustainability. And uh, some of his buildings uh, show it. So, uh, you know, kind of, you know, an Ikea home, you know. You yes. <laughs> You buy, you know, depending on your budget, uh, today one part, tomorrow another part, and by the time you buy this whole house, a new regulation comes into being telling you that you are not allowed to, <laughs> to mm. do something like this. Anyway, Piano and Rogers. Now, this was a very fruitful uh, partnership uh, because of, of winning uh, Pompidou Center in Paris from 1971 to 1977, but they built two other buildings before, uh, before the Pompidou Center, uh, or almost before, because the BMB Italia headquarters began um, after they won the competition. Uh, and uh, here they are, <laughs> mm. the happy young architects. Can you imagine to win, uh, you know, such a, an important commission in Paris? Uh, especially since, I mean, they didn't expect to win and they won. So, yeah. of course, they laugh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like this picture very much. I mean, you know, and if this picture doesn't encourage the students to be optimistic and go for exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they are beautiful. Anyway, mm. so let's not become too emotional. B&B B &B Italia, 1972, 1973. Uh, a very, you know, uh, uh, a, a good building, but uh, a building that is, uh, uh, again, anticipating a little bit uh, uh, the, what was to follow. Hmm. Here also you see the care for, for, uh, for, for structure and the care for detail. Uh, and 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 uh, what is remarkable about uh, about this uh, period? I mean, they were very young, uh, but uh, there, there is a certain maturity, and 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 they also there are elements of this work that that uh, announce what was to follow: the yes, use of indeed. primary wow. colors, uh, and and, and uh, you know, the, uh, Richard Rogers in particular advocated bringing outward, uh, outwardly the, um, what Louis Kahn would, would call the servicing uh, areas. I mean, all the, you know, the structure was supposed to come to be visible from the outside, uh, uh, ducts, all the mechanical architecture, the mechanical mm -hmm. engineering was very honestly shown outside of the building and with courage. And I think, uh, um, I, I don't know. I like it. I like I like the fact that uh, you know the, the the constituents, the components of architecture uh, are, are shown with, and, and not only that they are shown, but they have plastic or artistic or architectonic quality because they use these colors and they are sculptural, and uh, so there is a freshness about this that mm. uh, sometimes I miss these days. You know, this building is still a building that I think, uh, you know, if you built it today, you wouldn't be too ashamed. Uh, but, but there was a period of time then, there was a certain amount of, maybe I idealized, but it's, no, no, I, 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 maybe I idealized, but it was a time of, of, of uh, 
you know, when people wanted change, wanted to fight against the war yes. in Vietnam, that there were, the, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. And there, there, there was a, the young aspired towards a better world. And somehow this is seen also in the architecture produced by mm. some people of the time. No, the and in the in the music too. So there was a lot of experimentation going on at that time, as you said, Jimi Hendrix and others. Yeah. Yes, and I I, I really think uh, uh, I mean I I would be very happy to see uh, something like this today. Of course, we have the pandemic now and the climate mm. change, but um, and other issues too. But I don't know that 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 part of of the twentieth century still inspires me. Okay, so they won the competition. The people who didn't expect to win, they won it. And for six years, they worked on this building and they built it. Mm. And uh, it, it is there for all to see. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, when I was much younger, I wrote an essay where I expressed some doubts about this building. I didn't, I didn't have the, the intuition that later on I would talk uh, in, um, you know, uh, admirative uh, ways about it. Mm. So, you know, uh, time is uh, is uh, acting uh, in its own mysterious ways. So it is a cultural machine uh, uh, right in the center of Paris and uh, it functions very well. Um, you know, we have with us two great engineers, maybe if you want to say something more uh, yeah. specific than I can do, I would welcome that. The, the, the one thing I would say, I mean, architecturally, I am completely with you. I think that it was a... Uh, a groundbreaking idea and by exporting all of the, the servicing elements to the outside of the building, the gallery spaces are really amazingly flexible on the inside and they give the, the curators uh, a lot of freedom in how they can organize uh, their shows. The, the thing that is not so good about the building is really the maintenance because every element that you see has to be painted and uh, cleaned and uh, it corrodes. And uh, the French are, I'm sorry to say, not very well known for a maintenance culture. So had this been in Germany, it would have been fine. But uh, in France, uh, the usual approach seems to be to wait until it fails and then sue everybody. So many years after the building was opened, uh, we got sued because some systems were sort of beginning to corrode away and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, the maintenance is, is important too. Mm. Um, okay, so here how it, this is how it looks like from the top, from the air. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a machine, it's a machine. Mm. Uh, it was very well conceived, I must say. It's, uh, I admire the building a lot. Do you know uh, in the, uh, what was specifically the contribution of Peter Rice? Uh, the entire structural uh, structural thing. I think uh, Bruce, you can speak more eloquently on that. But the whole concept of creating this type of structure with uh, the tensile element on the outside to to create. The, the large, clear, open span on the inside was, uh, I think, his contribution conceptually. And then figuring out the uh, the uh, castings and the details and all of that to actually make it work in an elegant way. <clears throat> Thank you. Um... Well said, Mahadev. I don't I don't have anything to add to that. <clears throat> you know, uh, in front of except. It is... um, Except we should also talk about Tom as well, right? Mahana? Yeah. Like it was Tom and Peter. So it wasn't just structure. It's, you know, all of the engineering that goes into this, this building and that's expressed as architecture. So one thing I would say about that. So when you look at all these items in blue, which are the air conditioning ductwork, and then you see the elevators and so on that are highlighted in other colors, um, if those things were to be hidden on the inside of the building, 
typically you would not take so much care to sort of arrange them in an aesthetic way. So to say that you're just bringing these things and expressing them on the outside is a little too simplistic in terms of uh, uh, what has actually happened here. Uh, here, the systems have been rearranged uh, in a way that actually contributes to the architecture. It's not just a, uh, oh, we just take off the covers and this is what you see. Uh, Mr. Agent, uh, I, I, agent you, I saw you raising the hand. Please be kind and, and uh, step in. You can talk uh, without... Um, so, uh, Thank for you. me, for me, uh, because this is one of the most important uh, buildings uh, representing the high uh, high tech architecture, and uh, uh, when I uh, spoke to to my students, I told them that uh, if uh, what is important in high tech is that the three elements of uh, Vitruvius, uh, uh, Utilitas, Firmitas, and uh, Venustas. Here, uh, Firmitas, it's not only uh, uh, the system of sustaining the building, but it's the system of expressing architecture. So what is important is that structural elements and service elements became elements of expressing, uh, mm. tool of express, uh, expression for architecture. And uh, uh, I always uh, ask myself how it works a team of architects with engineers and how architect, uh, which is the responsible for the expression of, uh, for the architectural expression of the building, how it, uh, how he works to, to keep in, in his hands the conception. Uh, because it's, I think it's a very special collaboration between architects and uh, engineers in this, this kind of buildings. And uh, because you are, uh, uh, you have invited here uh, engineers which you work with uh, Richard Rogers, if I understood well, uh, it's very interesting to, to uh, find out how a team uh, working for this kind of building work. Mm. It's, uh, uh, the important thing is that it's very much a parallel process. So uh, there is a, the, approach which uh, I would say was had been refined in New York, for example, uh, with many of the high-rise buildings here where essentially the architect, structural engineer and mechanical engineer understood their domains and they developed a kind of formula where they could almost work independent of each other and achieve a, a building that was very uh, competently put together and would uh, would work and everything was fine. Um, that is a different process to what, what happened here. Here, the uh, almost from the very outset with some very basic sketches, you would find that uh, Richard Rogers, Peter Wrights, and Tom Barker would be sitting around the blank sheet of paper, contributing to each other's uh, thoughts and riffing off each other's ideas. And uh, the thing that I, I particularly observed in, uh, in uh, Peter Rice in all of that was that he was prolific at coming up with, uh, with structural ideas, but he did not get attached to a single one of those ideas. So he would put an idea out there and if it achieved traction in the conversation, he would help develop it further. If it didn't achieve traction, he would drop it instantly and move on to the next thing. So it required a kind of uh, lack of selfishness on the, on the part of the engineer to be creative and yet accept that the master creator there is the architect. Yeah, thank and you. It, I, I, I almost was sure that uh, it was this kind of collaboration because uh, when an engineer uh, uh, dimension his, uh, his elements, uh, structural engineer, uh, sometimes uh, what results is not so interesting as expression for, uh, for architects. So, uh, I imagined, I, I supposed that uh, it is a kind of, uh, of challenge, uh, of, of uh, change of uh, ideas uh, and the step by step to, to find the solution which is agreeable for both. Mm. 
But it's interesting that at some point, the, something comes on the page that everybody says, ah, yes, this is great. And uh, you get those aha moments in those types <laughs> of uh, collaborations. Uh, I can tell you another time about a competition that with an architect in Chicago, where we worked very hard uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the morning to achieve uh, a response for this competition and we failed. And then we went to lunch and we ordered the food and between the time that uh, we ordered and the time that the food was served, the idea was expressed on a napkin in the in the restaurant and we all agreed, yes, that's, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, so sure. <laughs> it's it's not so much the toil as the uh, willingness to, to be open to ideas and you never know when they will come. Yes, and always the ideas come uh, like bulk. Hmm. Just once. Not, yeah. not, not feel step by step. Thank you, thank you. It was interesting what you said. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so, you know, I think in, in essence, it is about a collaboration with the engineer. I mean, the architect and the engineer to work together from the very beginning and not the usual way where the, the architect uh, kind of, um, you know, arrives at a crystallized uh, so-called solution and then goes to the engineer. Although there are some, some architects uh, who work like this, maybe many of them. Like I know Ishigami in Japan, he, he you know, he just throws ideas on, um, you know, on paper, just, just imagines whatever he wants to imagine without thinking about the structure. And then he invites the engineer to make the thing possible. But this, uh, this, uh, this kind of collaboration where they are from the beginning kind of uh, working together is maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, it's better and also maybe more more profitable in the sense, a good sense of the word, and in a way closer to to what happened before the Renaissance when the architect was a master builder. So the architect, as we know him or her to today, was uh, almost unknown until Alberti. So that, that medieval uh, builder was living many times on the site on the on the on the site of the building and uh, he was uh, the, you know both in a way an engineer and an architect and the builder so i do believe that there are architects who also have uh, uh, they have uh, the capacity to 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 express um, uh, you know uh, to be concerned actually about beauty uh, I, I, I doubt that, uh, uh, be, because we are all human beings, it doesn't really matter the specialization. You can, you can get uh, uh, great ideas uh, from, uh, you know, uh, probably for, from, from almost anyone. So anyway, you know that famous uh, the image or drawing by Le Corbusier where he shows the collaboration between architect and engineer in uh, in uh, truly in equal in, in equality uh, and we use that image when bruce uh, presented um, uh, his work and uh, when he made that presentation that's a very very nice uh, um, uh, you know appeal of le corbusier to a collaboration that is not uh, you know that doesn't underline the so-called uh, you know importance of the architect Anyway, um, Dan, maybe a, a music analogy is good here. So you have like, you have the rock star and then you have the backup vocals and the people that are doing the backup vocals, they're, you know, they're happy to be somewhat in the shadows, right? They don't really strive for the limelight and maybe the architect engineering relationship. And maybe we go back to history and, and, and it would be interesting to study some of the master builders, like, you know, who did they rely on? Because certainly they didn't do these things all by themselves. Um, and like when we look at Eiffel, you know, there was, there was an assistant engineer supporting Eiffel in all his works. Um, and there's that famous picture of him on top of the Eiffel Tower, on top of the stair, and his assistant is down at the bottom of the stair, you know, almost holding him up, like he's standing on his shoulders. 
Uh, I think, you know, certainly the same was true for Fry Auto. Uh, and we can say for Piano and Rice and uh, Richard Rogers. <clears throat> thank, thank so there, no doubt there there's a, somebody behind Calatrava also that we don't know. Absolutely, but there's, there's, there's I think, um, a very mature uh, and proper role for the engineer is to understand that they're the co-star, they're not the star, mm. or they're the supporting actor, right? They don't, they don't get the Oscar for best for leading actor. They get, you know, they're they're, they're a supporting role. And I think if you if you take that attitude, it really can help you. Uh, sort of instead of having a sort of democracy or even anarchy but have more of a of a dictatorship and hopefully the architect is benevolent so it's a benevolent dictatorship so this is what you want Bruce uh, the benevolent dictatorship of the architect <laughs> that's what I'm that's that's where I'm at right now Dan you yeah. could change my mind yeah. <laughs> Mahat, if you could change my mind as well. No, I, I agree with you. And in fact, uh, uh, to have somebody who's actually deciding on the direction is very important. Uh, I don't know whether dictatorship is quite the, uh, the right analogy, but uh, something like that for sure. Yeah. Somebody has to be the conductor of the orchestra and has to take a firm hand. And, and maybe, what maybe. is interesting that he is not singing. <laughs> the director is not singing. Yeah. All the other are singing. Mm. It's uh, what is uh, what is uh, very clear uh, in uh, in this image. Uh, all you see is not architecture primarily. It's uh, uh, systems of uh, structure and uh, services. And the architect is maybe a better uh, analogy is the symphony and the architect is the exactly. conductor. Exactly, yeah. and and the architect is the dirigent, is the yeah. director. Mm. Uh, 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 Bruce and Mahadev, uh, what are these white uh, things? The three in the what? Function? Oh, they are they are uh, ventilation for the basement. So it's uh, the air is being thrown out uh, above uh, head height. Thank you. I don't know if it's ex if it's a combination of exhaust and intake, but it's it's one or the other. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay, so here is uh, you know the competition entry, uh, the drawing that was done for the competition that they won, uh, and uh, of course from this um, almost sketch to the <laughs> build work, uh, there was a distance, but uh, the idea was there. And once the idea was there, you know, uh, it was clear. I've heard once Bernard Chumi saying, you know, a good building, the conception of a good building can be explained to your grandmother in one mi minute on the phone. Hmm. Now, now, I don't know if one minute <laughs> is really enough, but there is a little bit of truth. When you arrive at a strong idea, you know, clearly conceived, uh, clearly expressed, you know, uh, that helps probably. Anyway. You know, a slight elaboration of that, which I have observed in Renzo Piano's work more than in Rogers, is that almost all of his buildings can be described with one single section through the building. That you take that one section and it completely explains the, the architecture for you. Hmm. I think in general for a good architecture piece, if you can explain uh, to somebody which is not a specialist in few words, what is the concept of the building? The building is good architecture. Otherwise, it's not good architecture. Mm. <clears throat> I don't know who made this uh, sketch. Maybe Rogers, maybe Renzo. This uh, looks like the hand of Rogers because I recognize its kind of style from... Uh, the other project that I worked on, the Court of Human Rights. You we'll arrive at that building that. too, thank yeah. you. Um, thank 
So what is interesting is, although the, 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 the facade is, is um, highly te technological, but it has a, a, a also an artistic expression. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is alive. It has a, uh, you know, uh, it is abstract, of course. It is technical, but it's not cold. It's not, uh, I, I would consider it uh, architecturally expressive. Mm. Very much so. The plan, essentially, this is what it is, you know, simplistically put. The, the empty, large space, uh, the inside, and then uh, everything else that served this large space at the outside. And, uh, yeah, I have seen the exhibition one year ago on Tadao Ando, uh, retrospective here, the Centre Georges Pompidou. And, uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter too much. I mean, it's not so much connected with this building. Now we arrive at the third uh, period in Richard Rogers' uh, uh, practice, probably the most fruitful because he built the most as the Richard Rogers partnership. And we start with the Lloyd's uh, building in London. I, sorry, I typed wrongly there. Um, it was considered the first high-tech building, although you know, you cannot. Yeah, believe. as you say, I think that there were others that came before. Yeah. Yes, of course, and even Centre Georges Pompidou. Mm. Uh, but this is maybe uh, we have here with us someone who can tell us a little more about this, even if he was a junior architect at that time. A junior engineer, yes, a <laughs> very junior. junior. Sorry, <laughs> no, maybe maybe I was not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. we say the correct things by accident. They yeah, maybe. Mistake. Maybe. Mm. But actually, this this section uh, uh, expresses, uh, not section, this elevation expresses some of the, the things that I wrestled with uh, internally, intellectually, with this project uh, when I was working on it. Um, so, as, as the junior most uh, engineer and the one that was most familiar with the uh, then evolving computer software and things like that, it was still very rudimentary software, but this was one of the early buildings where we decided to use uh, computer analysis to work out the cooling loads and the energy consumption and all of that in this building. And also having just come through the energy crisis, which happened in the mid and late 70s, uh, this building was one of the first ones where we actually had an energy consumption target that we, uh, that we put out. And uh, so we said that the uh, energy consumption of the, this building, we were aiming to achieve one gigajoule per square meter per year which in today's terms, that's, uh, that's a fairly pedestrian target. But at that time, it was like, wow, you know, we, are, we have an energy target and we have to achieve it. And of course, I was the, the, the young guy that was uh, running the computer to figure out the, the answers to whether we were meeting that energy target or not. And I was a very frustrated person because uh, one of the aspects of a building that leads to additional energy consumption is surface area. And you can see that every element of this, if you take the staircases, this, each staircase has uh, four exposed surface, surfaces because it's like a spiral that's completely articulated. And the, uh, the toilet modules were prefabricated. You can just about see them on the right-hand side there where each of those modules has five exposed surfaces. It comes on the back of a truck, it gets hoisted in place and plugged into the building. And when you calculate all of the heat loss and the heat gain through all of these surfaces, you find that the, the building is working against itself in terms of <laughs> energy consumption because you have the target and we are working very hard with the building systems to make them very efficient by using thermal mass and storing excess heat in the sprinkler tank overnight so that you can use it the next day for uh, warming, uh, warming the air to preheat the building. We were taking the heat from the lights and putting it through the layers of the facade 
to reduce the heat loss at the perimeter of the building. There was a lot of such technological innovation going on. And meanwhile, the architects were busy increasing the surface area of the building to create more heat loss and heat gain. In fact, I got so frustrated by that process that I left the firm to go and do a master's degree for a year because I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> But before leaving, we had already figured out the, the systems like the thermal mass and the underfloor heating, sorry, the underfloor air supply, uh, the ventilated facade, all of those things were in place. And also for this atrium that you see just sticking above, we did some very early three-dimensional shading studies, which involved... Uh, going onto the roof of our building with a physical model and taking photographs of the shadow pattern on the building at different times of day, because we didn't have good software at that time that would do that for us. So very exciting times. I uh, learned a lot working on this project, but I was also somewhat frustrated, as I said. Uh, uh, I'm very glad you you told that this uh, this uh, what happened uh, this story because I I do think uh, uh, architects often are actually ignoring ignoring uh, you know even today when they talk about sustainability and ecology and whatever losses of energy but the truth is they don't care uh, a lot about uh, they, they use the words but they don't actually care uh, there are very few people who uh, very serious about it. It's maybe because, you know, the architect is concerned with uh, aesthetical matters, but I think a good architect should go beyond uh, that, mm. um, you know, preference. Because I, I understand very well your, your, your frustration. You know, you were working hard to, to save energy and the architect was busy uh, simultaneously to increase the loss of energy. <laughs> Okay, but it is. But you know, I've I've kind of come to terms with that, and today I still think very fondly about uh, the the building and the role that I had on it, and what I learned from, uh, you know, cutting my teeth as it were as a young engineer working on such a fascinating project. Who who did the structure for this building? This was also Peter Rice and Tom Barker were the lead uh, uh, structural and the mechanical engineers. So the same team as uh, on the Pompidou Center. But then there was another leading light that came in under, under Peter Rice, John Thornton, who then became uh, one of the key structural collaborators for Michael Hopkins. And one, um, of, the, one of the interesting things that Peter would say about the structure here is the articulation of concrete structure in that there's precast elements and in situ cast in place concrete and the joints for that are articulated. You see these column to beam to slab joints and it was kind of, it was, it was a tectonic expression of, of those you know, the same material, but different methods of construction. And there's some beautiful pictures of, of like, of people close to these joints, and you get the sort of human scale and the, what is it, anthropomorphic mm -hmm. quality of the tectonic design. So it's like, it's very interesting. You see the form savers, you know, the little holes for the form savers. You see the sculpted form of that, those column capitals, those sort of, mm -hmm slab column joints um, I just want to emphasize very um, not only is it is it articulating the construction of it so in a sense a very strong structural tectonic but it has a, a very interesting scale to it as well that is meant to humanize that and this was the the, um, the work of um, the engineer or the architect or both, because I, I, I think what you said is very, very important. Who decided to do this? It's a conversation, right? And uh, the, the uh, agreement that this is the way to proceed comes out of, the, out of a discussion. So at the end of the day, everybody ends up being the author. Excellent, beautiful. 
And uh, you see, sorry, can you go back for one second? You see all the dots on the floor there, those circles? Yes. Those are all air supply diffusers and they were produced by a firm in Germany called Kranz, K-R-A-N-T-Z. And in fact, if you look at the blue carpet on the other floors, you can just about make out uh, those diffusers there as well. So this was one of the very first buildings that I know of, uh, of this scale that you made use of an underfloor air supply system to, to do the air conditioning. Now I would have never guessed. Thank you very much. Although maybe it would not have been so difficult, but um, no, it I makes, it that makes so much sense, Mahara, for such a large atrium to just condition yeah, the first couple of meters of the space. Right. Not to have to condition the whole space. So what is the function of these diffusers to, to, to bring in fresh air? Well, to bring in the conditioned air. To, uh, so in other words, instead of having the air conditioning come down from the ceiling, you are bringing it up from the floor. And as Bruce was explaining there, what that does is it allows you to just maintain a comfortable condition in the zone of the occupants and to allow the temperature above their heads to, to get quite high. And so you don't waste energy uh, cooling the entire space. You're only cooling the, the zone that the people are in. <clears throat> yes, it does make sense, but it's not uh, noticeable. I mean, if you step you know, on, on the thing or around it, is it the, the air is not coming uh, you know, in a noticeable way. Sorry, you mean if you're standing at this balcony and sticking your head into the atrium, would you feel that it was hot? No, no. I mean, if you step on one of those little... Oh, okay. This is step. why I mentioned Krantz. So Krantz developed a uh, special floor outlet, which imparts a swirling motion to the air as it comes out. So through a process called entrainment, what, what happens is that within about... Uh, half a meter of that diffuser, all of the velocity has been taken out. It's mixed the air very well. And so you do not feel a draft when you put your hand. If you're within half a meter, yes, you feel it. But beyond that, you don't really feel it at all. Thank you. So, hmm. so yes, you're right. If it was just a hole in the floor, it would be very uncomfortable for everybody. But with the special diffuser, that solved that problem. Yes, thank you. Now, in the plan, it is very uh, uh, easily seen, uh, you know, the, the strategy used by uh, these so-called high-tech architects that they bring outside of the building, uh, you know, the stairs, uh, services, and so on. And they become actually the, 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 the interesting part, architecturally speaking, because otherwise, you know, the rectangle of the, of, the, of the building is not so interesting. But because of these very sculptural uh, uh, elements, uh, it becomes uh, very alive. Louis Kahn did it very differently at Richard's Laboratories in uh, Philadelphia. Mm. Uh, he also uh, uh, enclosed the, the serving spaces uh, in towers which were expressed um, dramatically at, on the outside of the building, but, but there, there was a certain historicism influenced by San Gimignano, what he saw in that little town in Italy. Essentially, conceptually, is the same, uh, the same uh, strategy, but, but the architectural is, expression is very different. That was the building that made uh, made uh, Louis Kahn, uh, you know, so-called famous, uh, most instantly. The Richards Laboratories and the scientists uh, complained that uh, yes, the towers. Well, there was another thing. Uh, um, Kahn was afraid that the ducts and the pipes would take over the building, and uh, he, he he he. I think he was afraid of them. So he in encapsulated them into these towers, but, the, uh, um, uh, but he used a lot of glass for the spaces dedicated to science. 
And so when I visited the building, I noticed that the scientists uh, covered the, the glass with a lot of aluminum foil. And uh, so they were a little bit tired of, 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 of all that so-called uh, free space, uh, highly luminous and uh, right. highly, highly sunny and so on. Mm. But here, you know, I, I, I like, I'm not a high-tech man at all, but uh, I, I admire the, the, the sculpture of the, the visceral, uh, sculpturality, if, I, if there is such a word, probably there isn't, of, mm. of, of bringing, bringing outside what was usually hidden, you know, because I, mm. I, I think sometimes it's, it's very beneficial to, to see the hidden side of life. And, and, and uh, you know, this is almost like in terms of uh, psychoanalytic language is the id ID of, of, um, of uh, architecture. You know that <clears throat> Sigmund Freud uh, differentiated between three levels of of the psychic life, and the deepest, the hidden, the most hidden was id, uh, and the unconscious. So you know, if you try to see some kind of parallel between uh, psychoanalysis and what is happening here, the id, the unconscious, is coming. Uh, in, in full light is, 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 is leaving the hidden uh, space mm. that was destined to it and um, it takes um, uh, a main role on the stage. I always like that. Mm. But some people... And you know the, the interesting thing here is that people in uh, Richard Rogers' office drew every one of these details on the pipes and the, and the structure. So in a typical building the architect might indicate the spaces where these things are going to go, but they will not uh, waste any time in actually articulating what it looks like. But here, there were young architects that were drawing these pipes and these ducts and these structural details. <clears throat> A good observation, yes. Because you cannot let the beast uh, get wild without yeah. without uh, you know kind of controlling it aesthetically right so it's and in fact thing. i have a story later uh, i don't know if you're going to show the pa technology center near princeton uh, if you have that project uh, then uh, there's a story about where the beast actually escaped <laughs> <laughs> i'm a, i don't i don't think i have that word um, okay uh, but you can tell us the story now if if you don't need the uh, you know an image. Yes, sure. L l let me tell uh, it now. It's it's also very much uh, a high tech uh, building in this genre, and it came about. Uh, it was completed somewhere around 1984, 1984, 1985, and uh, although Lloyd's was still in construction at that time, the conception of that project came after Lloyd's. So a lot of the capability within Richard's office to uh, articulate and detail all these things existed. So they came up with the scheme, which was a central structural uh, tower, if you like. It was a single story building. So central structural tower uh, with two wings that stretch out that were suspended from that, uh, that tower. And then uh, the office space was in a column free area uh, underneath those two wings. Uh, I hope I've uh, described that enough for people to imagine it. And then, so this tower was set up as a series of frames and by connecting the frames together, you get the, the big area of the building itself. Now, between the frames exposed at the top were all of the mechanical systems and electrical systems that would serve the building. And so they became an important part of the architectural expression of the building. You have the structural frame, encompassing these mechanical systems, which would then feed down into the building to serve the area below. Now, the Richard Rogers detailing stopped at the point where the, the ducts and cables and all of that entered the, the surface of the building. And the arrangement of those elements on the interior was left to the local architectural and engineering team that supervise the, the construction uh, process. And you can tell that whereas there's an order and, and a sort of uh, 
aesthetic to the exposed services that you see on the outside. On the inside, where those services were also exposed, they look kind of they looked kind of haphazard at the time when I visited the building. This was way back during during construction, and it was a disappointment. It was like, oh, what happened here? And then if you think about it, those things were designed purely according to engineering principles. And uh, you know, you need to get the air from here to here. You need to do it with the minimum amount of pressure loss. So you run a duct to achieve that uh, objective. But the piece that's missing in that thinking process is what does it look like? And how does it fit in with everything else that it's, uh, it's surrounded by? So, this is why if you go to a typical building and you take down the suspended ceiling and look at the services above, it's not a pretty sight. But there's no reason why it shouldn't be a pretty sight, as we saw in the buildings like Lloyd's where thought was put into the arrangement of those elements. <clears throat> yes, very good observation. Uh, thank you very Mahadev, much. Mahadev, I, Mahadev, I think that would probably be a very, very interesting building to talk about. Um, from the structural perspective as well, and that there's some really interesting things going on with the geometry and second order behavior. And it might have yes, been sort of right. pivotal in, I'm just thinking this, just I'm, I'm making a guess that it was pivotal in Rice's direction towards lightweight structures mm. and, and the nonlinear. Right, could have been, yes. I remember the discussions. There were some uh, discussions about second order behavior that in fact came to light after the basic scheme had already been set in place and required some rethinking of uh, structural behavior. That's my vague memory as a young mechanical engineer on the project. So I may be mischaracterizing that. Yeah, I, I wasn't there, so I'm just guessing, mm -hmm. but I do know the structure and it does rely on some interesting behavior for its mm. out of plane stability. Ah, right. Mm. Anyway. Mm. <clears throat> so uh, the conclusion would be, if there is to be a conclusion, is that if there is care in, 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 uh, in being attentive to how uh, the beast looks like, the result is, is, is very positive. But if you yes. are not careful, <laughs> then uh, the, the, the beast could bite you. It can, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Here is another building uh, by Sir Richard Rogers. Uh, I want to see too much on this because we really have to go through a very large mm -hmm. amount of works. But uh, I show it. Uh, he, sometimes he is... Uh, you know, using a more quiet or reticent uh, approach to architecture. And maybe this is the case here to an extent. <clears throat> now we arrive at a building where uh, uh, Mahadev was uh, the, the lead uh, engineer now, in the mechanical engineer now. Yes, on the mechanical side. Okay, so I'll just shut up now. No, that, you don't have to do that. Uh, in fact, it's good that you start with this view, which is the view of uh, the the head of the building, if you like, uh, which shows the, the two uh, elevated courtrooms. So these are the courtrooms where they would actually conduct the, the proceedings. And then the glass structure down below is the main entrance hall to the building. And this is single glazed and it's very transparent as you can see. As you can see. And then peeping out, uh, in fact, you can see it more in the, in the detail down below are these two towers, which were the elevator towers. And there were also very significant uh, zones for the transportation of pipes and uh, ducts and things like that. So what is interesting here is that by the time we get to this building, they are not so much insisting on exposing everything. That there are still elements that you see exposed, such as the structural uh, uh, pieces that come down in red. Uh, I don't know what to call that. Is it bracing? Uh, so, so those are very much uh, articulated, but other other elements are now uh, inside the building. Now, 
the thing about this head of the building is that this was the part of the building that had the highest energy consumption. And by the time we were doing this project, uh, every country had energy codes and France had some very strict energy codes and they needed to, uh, to meet, uh, they needed us to meet uh, those energy targets. The main problem with this part of the building is that huge glazed entrance hall because they insisted that the glazing must be curved and I'm glad they did. There was no way at that time to get double glazing in, in a curved format. And so that glazing had to be single glass, which then meant that it had a huge heat loss in the, in the winter and it had a significant heat gain in the summer, which raised the energy consumption of the building. So, that was almost the, the key reason why the, the tail of the building, which you do not see in this picture, but I hope you have other pictures for that, was designed in such a way that it would be very minimal in its consumption of energy. And so by taking the minimal consumption in the tail and the excessive consumption in the head and putting it together, the average met the energy code. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was quite uh, quite an exercise for for the mechanical engineers on the project uh, doing that work. Do you have a picture of the of the back end of the building? I have uh, other pictures. Yes, uh, please let me know. I'll show all of them now, and please let me know if you see something that. Uh, okay, good. Uh, you saw this one. We saw this. Yes, one. keep going. This is the stair right here. You see that expressiveness that uh, that you get. I would. I really like if you go back to that picture, Dan. I really like like the way that color is used. Yeah. On this project, so the red from the, you know, the key structural mm -hmm. elements that are red from the outside of the building, then work their way in, and then the stair comes down in this blue. I really like the colors, and I like the use of color. And just as a, as a bit of trivia, the lead architect on this, uh, the guy that was basically in charge of this project within Richard's office, was a guy called uh, Amo Kalsi. And Amo Kalsi was one of the guys on the Lloyds building that worked out all of those details of the ductwork and things like this. Uh, he was the one doing those drawings. And then the deputy architect on this was uh, Ivan Harbour, who is now one of the partners. So the latest incarnation of that firm is Roger Sturk Harbour. The Harbour is Ivan Harbour who worked on this project. And who was the gentleman that always dressed in red? Oh yes, the red guy. Uh, I can't remember his name offhand if you have gone blank. You have red hair as well? Uh, no, he didn't have red hair. Uh, it was, <laughs> was reddish, yeah, okay, red, yeah. Ginger hair. Something like Mark Davies? Mark Davies, that's the one, yeah. That's the guy, one of the partners who dressed in the, that color that we saw up there <laughs> all the time. So he's a partner now, no, of Richard Rogers? Who, Mark Davis or no, Ivan Harbour is now one of the uh, partners with the name on the, on the firm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No, he, I'm a little bit confused because he had uh, several firms with different names. And uh, now, in, indeed, there are, I think, three partners or so. Your yes. So, so the old set of three partners in Richard Rogers' partnership were Richard Rogers himself, uh, John Young, who I think John Young was also there as in the earlier incarnation, and a guy called Marco Goldschmid, who was an architect, but he was really more of a businessman. And uh, it was the three of them that were basically the, the leaders of the firm. And... The big contribution of Marco Goldschmidt was he was the one that uh, basically did the deal to secure that campus that they have in Hammersmith, uh, which is where their office is currently located. And uh, what what happened, and somebody described, yeah, just wait on this picture, but let me finish the story yes. about uh, Marco Goldschmidt. Uh, when they acquired that property there, they renovated uh, a part of it and uh, let it out to other businesses for uh, 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 to get some rental income. And then they had their own office, which was in one of those buildings, which was a combination of renovation and a new build. 
And at one point I heard that the income for the Richard Rogers partnership from the rental was almost equal to their income from doing architecture. And what happened as a result of that is that they would take a very sort of non-commercial approach towards doing their work. That uh, if they needed to put more effort into working out some details, they were happy to put in that effort and there was that money never seemed to be a problem for them. But the difficulty in that process that it became a problem for the engineers because they would be willing to uh, constantly re-examine aspects of design that we thought we had already finished. And so it became quite difficult for us to make a profit on projects working with uh, Richard Rogers. Not that we didn't, but it became difficult. So I think that it also says something about architects that have an independent source of income often have the ability to, to really explore and, uh, and work on things uh, to a greater extent than those that maybe don't. Mm. Did okay, you want so, to say something about this picture? Yes, I did want to say something. So uh, the, the thing I would like you to, to notice is that uh, on the wings of the building, uh, uh, that are away, it's the tail end of the building, you'll notice that the top level of that building has a slightly different art architectural expression to the lower part of the building. And similarly, there's uh, what, what's called the, the conference part of the building, which is immediately behind the drums, where you see that there's a top glazed element, uh, whereas the floors down below are pretty much completely clad in this uh, metallic uh, cladding. Can you see that? Yes. So the history of this is that uh, we finished the design of this building and it was under construction. And uh, the, uh, I'm forgetting the years, it must have been around 1990 or thereabouts. The building was under construction and the foundations for the entire building had been uh, constructed. They were finished and they were about to start on the superstructure. That was the time when the Berlin Wall came down. And so suddenly the Council of Europe, which is the client for this building, they decided that, uh, oh, you know what? We have a certain number of members. I think it was nine members or something like that now. But the chances are that we're going to get many more members after the, the Eastern Bloc uh, opens up. And so this building is not going to be adequate for all of the new members that come along. So they stopped the, the project and they, and they asked the design team to relook at it to see how they could make the building bigger. And this is a, a kind of strange thing to do once uh, the building is already underway. And so, for example, I think the only thing that st stayed the same size was the entrance hall. Both of those courtrooms, which are the elevated structures at the front, were increased in diameter so that they could accommodate more judges and uh, a larger uh, volume of people in the proceedings. And then in the rest of the building, an additional level was added. So that glassy bit that you see right on top of the building in the middle section and in the tail was an afterthought to increase the capacity of, of the building. And the reason why it was made so light was that the foundations were already in the ground. So there was a limit as to how much additional load could be accommodated in those existing foundations. So the construction was made as light as possible for that extra addition on top. Now, that work was done by a totally different design team to the original engineering design team of which I was a part. So by the time that work was done, I had already moved to New York. Now, what was forgotten in the process was that we had designed those parts of the building with heavy thermal mass so that they would not require air conditioning in the summer months to compensate for the additional air conditioning loads that we had in the front part of the building. So when you put in the lightweight structure and it doesn't have air conditioning, suddenly it becomes a very uncomfortable uh, part of the building. So when this building opened, it opened on a day that happened to be a really hot day almost a design day. And the most uncomfortable part of the building was that top level of offices uh, on the wing, 
which is where, of course, the most important people in that uh, institution had their offices. So it ended up being a little bit of a disaster because the, uh, the conceptual thinking in terms of the environmental systems and how you maintain temperature and all that was not carried through once the client brought in this requirement for additional space. So they, uh, it was one of the sort of negative aspects of this building that uh, those things were not fully thought through once the building changed. But otherwise, a very interesting building. It, the building actually uses a heat pump system. So it draws water from underground, uh, uses that water for heating and cooling and uh, discharges it back. So it was a very early example of a, a use of a water source heat pump as a very energy uh, efficient way of uh, doing heating and cooling. Sorry, that was very long winded. I hope it was uh, helpful. <clears throat> no, it was very helpful because, uh, you know, often architects and students, we do not really think so much about these issues, but they are very, very important. Uh, and uh, now maybe more than ever. So, you know, I think the, the conductor of the orchestra should be now the, the mechanical engineer and uh, not the architect. Because well, uh, maybe the mechanical engineer has taken over the first violin position from the structural engineer. I don't know. <laughs> no, well, no, no, I, well, you know, if the climate change is as serious as it seems to yeah. be. Um, anyway, we move forward. Yeah, that was a at Mahat, if that was an interesting point of time, maybe about a decade later, where hmm. we'd show up to meetings and everybody wanted to talk to the mechanical engineer and then. You right. save five minutes at the end of the meeting to talk about the structure. It used to be the other way around. <laughs> used to be the other way around, yes. Certainly for the first part of my career, it was very much the other way around. Hmm. Okay, we move, move forward. Yeah. Here is a top view. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about this? or? Well, on these curved wings, uh, the way in which the uh, maintaining of temperature without uh, air conditioning was achieved was firstly by uh, ex having a lot of exposed concrete, both inside and on the facade of the building, and also having uh, ex uh, exterior planters. So you can see the vegetation that's hanging off the edge of the building. That's because you have these planters there. And the planters have a dual purpose. Obviously, there's an aesthetic purpose. If you put plants there, it creates a nice uh, environment for the occupants, but also the evaporation from the plants would cool down the concrete and thereby cool down the building as well. And also those planters would provide shading for the windows. Now, because that shading was not effective at all times of the day, there was also a system of exterior blinds that would automatically drop down to shade the facade when the sun was on the facade and would retract automatically at a time when, uh, when the sun was off the facade. So these were some of the technologies that we used on this building, which were really very much in their infancy at that time. So there was quite a lot of innovation that went into this building. Um, I think that's maybe all that I, I want to say. So do you think, uh, thank you, do you think uh, the, the, the building is still, uh, from, from this point of view of, uh, you know, energy consumption or energy saving is still valid today? It, it, it still functions properly? You yes, I, th I think it's still valid. So many of the things that we did in this building, I think have stood the test of time. Of course, uh, these days for the, the single glazing in that drum, we could have had curved double glazing. And so that would have, uh, had it been available as a, as a product at the time, then that would have been one en enhancement that I would have liked to have put in. I'd like, to, I'd like to share a brief story on this as well. Uh, Peter asked me to, to share some ideas on the underside of the structures of the, of the drums to mm. support them create something more sculptural and concrete. And I produced some sketches, but it, um, the structural team, it was a different structural team, right? It was Richard Howe. It was Richard group. Howe. Yeah, that's right. It was Richard and So Howe. I went over to see them and um, they weren't very interested in welcoming someone else to the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I think I learned a pretty valuable lesson by that. It's like how you approach these things diplomatically. Yeah. 
if if you have a good idea and so it was it was unsuccessful for me but and and i don't know Mahana, if you experienced the the site and the, I've been to Strasbourg, but I haven't been to the to the building. Um, whether that was a missed opportunity to create something more sculptural on the underside of the drums. Um, I thought that they uh, it's perhaps it could have been more sculptural, that's for sure. But I thought that they actually achieved a, a fairly successful uh, expression of what they were trying to trying to do. Uh, now the other thing to remember is that those legs also had uh, uh, other services and so on going through them, so they were quite uh, they were constrained not just by the uh, the need to hold up the drums, but also by the by providing the means for ventilating and servicing uh, the spaces above. So maybe the opportunities were more limited than if you were just thinking about the structural aspects of the design. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, did I understood? Uh, did I understand correctly, Bruce? Did you work on this building as well? Um, you know, it, it's it's like whenever somebody works on something, they 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 have there's it's a huge team. So, I I would say a, I spent maybe a day or two on this project. Just um, Peter saw that I was working on a competition. Um, and he was very interested in what I was doing. I was working on some um, spiral forms uh, and he wanted to see if I could explore those as the underside of the concrete of these, these drums. But um, that's as far as it got, to, that's as far as it got, Dan. Yeah, but so Peter it. Rice was the engineer, structural engineer for this building? Well, Peter would, Peter would show up at Richard's studio every yeah. Monday morning. This is how I understood it. Mahat, if you probably know That's much correct. more. That's correct. Both his, of them, both Peter his, and uh, Tom Barker would show up at Richard Rogers' uh, design crits every Monday morning, and they would review all of the projects that were happening in Richard's office, irrespective of who the actual engineers were. How, how, I, I really wish that we could replicate a process hmm. internally and with, with our collaborators. So... Dan, you know, think about how profound this is, is every Monday morning, the morning would be devoted to the project teams doing like crits, like you do in a studio at, at school, where the project teams would show their project, they'd show their project from process from the last week and their progress. And then there'd be a group of, you know, Richard and his partners and Peter and Tom, uh, and they'd you know, whether or not they were actively involved in the project, they would critique it. You know, just imagine the conversations and the, and how how the designs would really benefit from that. So every Monday, you start off, you prepare, you present your work, and then it gives you the inspiration and the ideas to chase for the next week until you have to present again. Uh, Mahadev, did you ever experience any of those crits? I just, never had the opportunity but... to actually attend them, but uh, I do remember the the architects, uh, Amo Kalsi and Ivan Haber, uh, having to prepare for those sessions and then coming back sometimes with their tails between their legs, uh, having to undo something that uh, we had worked on uh, the previous week because it was not well uh, liked at that uh, session. But it seems to me such a great recipe for collaboration and excellence in design. So, so they kept the design process at uh, quite a high intellectual level by providing those crits. Yes. Anyway, we Dan, should probably you're... move on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Dan, don't, don't you have any comment on that? Because I, I wasn't very sure this this picture is from within yes, this building. Yes, very much it's from that building. It's from inside one of the drums. And you see all these seats that are arranged in a curve? Yes. Yeah, with the blue chairs. Those are the judges. And there's one judge from every member country. And uh, it was in order to increase the number of seats that were possible there that they increased the diameter of the drums after the uh, 
the Berlin Wall came down. And then behind, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the glass panels. Uh, just between the wood and the, the white material at the yes. top, you see that glazed section. That's where the interpreters sit, because all of the proceedings are done in English and French. Those are the two official languages of the Council of Europe. And there was very strict requirements for the uh, uh, environment within those interpreters booths, because uh, uh, that's a very highly stressful job. They have to uh, listen and speak continuously. Uh, and then in the floor, you see the same circular Krantz diffusers, which uh, we researched on the Lloyds building, and then they became a kind of uh, normal part of almost uh, all the buildings that we did with uh, Richard Rogers, uh, underfloor air supply. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now we go to a building in Japan, the Kabuki Tower, 1997, 1993. <clears throat> but although uh, Sir Richard Rogers uh, has interest or had interest or had and has interest in sustainability, I think he didn't know or he ignored what Philip Johnson said that when you, when you, have an eye on the, on the energy bills, uh, you try to abstain from using too much glass. <laughs> but, but he uses a right. lot of glass. He does, yeah. Hmm. But they also have a lot of shading here, so you can see the exterior shading devices, uh, which are probably retractable. Uh, yes. Now the he built. I just want a quick comment on that. I think that oh, canted one, glass or? facade. Yeah, this one here. I don't. I don't that picture is not so great. I think that canted glass atrium facade is exquisite. I, I really like it. Yeah. Um, I, just the whole structural system for it, and I, I just think it's beautiful. Okay. Did RFR work on any of these buildings, uh, Bruce? Do you know? I don't. I don't know. It's a really good question. I, um, you know, we were doing that the Tokyo Forum competition with Rogers, hmm. and I think it was always Arab with Rogers. That's that would be my assumption. Right. Hmm. Except for maybe work that was in France. That Rogers was doing so that the the hotel that was in it was in Lille, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that's right, in Lille. Yeah, uh, we didn't win the project, but I, I think RFR was probably involved in that as well. I was working on that. Okay. So, what's with all these floral patterns on the on the cladding uh, between the the building and the staircase? That's very uncharacteristic, is it not? You mean here? Uh, no, uh, further to the left of that. You see those beige colored panels? Yes. They have a kind of flowery pattern on them. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that is unexpected. I would not expect that from Richard Rogers. Right. <laughs> but, uh, he had, I think, a hippie side. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we come to uh, three other buildings uh, in Berlin because he built three buildings here. But I think I have only pictures with two of them, both Renzo Piano. He, Renzo Piano did a master plan and uh, there were other architects involved, even Arata Isozaki and uh, Sir Richard Rogers. Uh, <clears throat> these are done by, uh, by, by uh, Richard Rogers. And I like them. They are. I have seen them. They are. They are vivacious, and uh, I, I like the fact that he uses colors so uh, without inhibitions. Um, so uh, we are very close to to the building that uh, Bruce worked on, right, with uh, uh, Helmut Jan. Oh yes, I worked on that one too. Ah, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Bruce and I collaborated on that. One. No, I was going to oh, yes. I was going to say that one. Yeah. Uh, so, do you know who was the engineer, the structural engineer for these building buildings? Was it uh, Jane Wernick, uh, Bruce? Do you know? I know she worked on some of these buildings. She was an engineer uh, at Arup. Uh, I don't not know. Not with us anymore. No. I think it was Jane Wernick. You know, there are many generations of Arup engineers that have worked on Richard Rogers' projects. Mm. Uh, of course, my uh, collaboration with them stopped in 1992 when I came to America. Now, this building here with a cube, uh, the green cube, is, it belongs to Renzo Piano, not to uh, Richard Rogers. Uh, this one, although right. this part is kind of similar to, to what he did in, uh, in Japan uh, himself. Now we arrive at this uh, this building, uh, which is uh, very cultural towards uh, you know the open space towards this intersection, and I, I like again the fact that he's uh, disintegrating almost the mon monolithical aspect of the building towards the entrance and towards so it's 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 invitational in a way it becomes friendly you know it doesn't scare yeah. you away uh, if i am to express myself uh, yes it pulls like, you in mm. yes um, in some ways you can see here a, a, a sort of inverted uh, uh, a similar approach to the court of human rights i mean physically it's slightly inverted but uh, otherwise there are a lot of elements that you can see a common authorship there <laughs> Just a second. Uh, yeah. I'm afraid I have to um, stop yeah, because somebody is talking uh, unrestrained. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> sorry, I have to shut off the microphone. Uh, but how do I do this? Mute. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, while you do that, Dan, um, I would just comment on that glass structure for that. The entrance and entry where there, it's so bold. Um, it's just such an amazing piece of structure, the, mm. that structural glass wall supported by a hyperbolic cable net mm. uh, with springs at the top. So the, the glass is actually hung from the top, panel to panel. Was that the first time something like that was done? No, no, a lot of that. And there's several other instances, right? But mm -hmm. that is the, I think, maybe it's the first time from a cable net. Do you know, you know Aurora Place that Piano did in Sydney? Mm. Has a sort of cable net slung glass uh, canopy. But that came but, later, didn't it? Yeah, that came later. So are you saying, uh, you know, Mahad, if it's like whenever you say the first of something, you have to yeah, put all these hard, qualifiers yeah. to yeah, it, yeah, right? Of course, you have to, yeah, yeah. So the first hyperbolic cable net strutted uh, hung glass wall sprung at the top. I don't know. Yeah. I could keep going, right? <laughs> you put enough qualifiers on it and anything could be the first, I suppose. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, it's gorgeous. So the the red the vertical parts are uh, structural. In this case, I think they're the uh, the rails for the elevators. So they're not holding up the building. Uh, so there are actually uh, three elevators. Yeah. Okay, now we arrive at, a, I would say, a spectacular work. And I know the, uh, uh, your, your, your company, your firm, Ove Arup, uh, designed, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, worked on that uh, spectacular roof, which I like so much. Uh, yeah. Where you, uh, 
part of the same, uh, uh, I mean, were you still working for uh, Overaru at the, at the time when this was made? Uh, I have only ever worked for Vara, but uh, it, I was uh, I was already in the U.S. and this was done by the U.K. people. Ah, so the, the U.K. office, okay. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, we have a we have an office in Cardiff, quite a big office that's very close to this building. So I expect that they were the the main people that uh, worked on this. But I have visited the building; it's spectacular. Yes, it's beautiful. And when you think that it's also for a you know, governmental building and mm. it's so innovative and uh, you know, almost avant-garde, I like this fact that um, you know, uh, political building in a way you know, uh, is, yeah. is open to experimentation. And uh, you know, the, the interiors is incredible, but also the interest, of course. And this is the sketch now maybe uh, Mahadev could tell us something here to, to decipher this cryptogram uh, because I think it has to do with energy, no? Yeah, it's to do with ventilation for sure. So uh, the the uh, hat that you see at the top with the little fin that's coming off it. Yes. Um, that is a, a device that you use for uh, creating a negative pressure to ventilate a space. So basically that fin will ensure that the ex exit point for the air is always facing downstream of the, of the wind. So you can see the blue wind arrows outside the building. And you can see that as the wind blows past that device, it's sucking air out of the building. So the red arrow that you see coming out of the building is exhaust. And so this is showing how that element on the roof is being used to ventilate the building by drawing the hot air out of the building. And then there are other little skylight devices that are also ventilated and you see those uh, expressed on the, the gray uh, shaded part of the roof. You can see little arrows coming out there. Yes. And then, of course, the yellow lines, uh, the straight lines, are uh, showing uh, what's going on in terms of lighting coming through, daylighting. And on the far left, you can see the use of an exterior shading device to uh, keep out uh, some of the, the sunshine, but letting a little part of it come through. And then just on the, on the left-hand side near the bottom, you can see uh, a little arrow that's shown sort of coming from the outside but going into the building. That shows a position for a fresh air intake. So obviously if air is being exhausted at the top, you need a place for the air to come in. So that's showing one of the places where the air can come into the building through the facade. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, do you think- can, this I, was... can I add a comment to this diagram? Sure. Um, what I find so fascinating about this is, is it's about design that you can't see. So the things you can't see, how do they affect the form? Yeah. And one of the things that one of the things that's missing here is the acoustics in the central drum, which was yeah. such an, an elemental part of the form. This interesting form that you see was iterated. Um, I don't know how many times, like, mm. you know, many, many, many times to find the right acoustic form so that speakers in the assembly could not only hear themselves speak, but could be heard well throughout the assembly. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Bruce. I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, this, um, you know, sketch, so to speak, this uh, was, was done uh, by the architect alone or by the architect in conjunction with um, mechanical engineers? I'm sure it was done in conjunction with the engineers because the way in which some of these ventilation arrows are shown are very characteristic of some of the uh, the people in our office, the way that they express and, and then, uh, these things. Yeah. No matter who made the sketch, Dan, I think you know the point I wanted to make is this kind of diagram is about the things that you typically don't see and how they affect the form. And you know, acoustics is such a big part of it. Like, how do you draw the acoustics in here? Well, yeah. you can't see it, but it's, it's such yeah. a the form is really fundamentally the interesting part of the 
this forum is fundamentally about acoustics and ventilation and natural light. So things that you don't normally see. And there's, I guess, you know, just to focus that comment, Dan, it's like there's so many hands in this, the realization of what this is. It doesn't matter really who drew it. Hmm. Yeah. Dan, can I say something? Please. Um, I mean, the structure and uh, mechanical uh, aspects of the building is hugely exciting and interesting. And I also find the, uh, the actual design, the actual planning and the configurations of these spaces, very exciting, typically for this building that is a government building. And the, the shape of the assembly room is quite different to the traditional kind of shapes of assembly rooms and is, 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 is fluid. And, and the building is kind of about encouraging openness and, yes. and open-mindedness. And I think in, in terms of architectural values, this is actually kind of doing something very positive for the people, for mm. the societies, and, and it is remarkable. <clears throat> Thank you, Azar. I totally agree with you. Yes. Yeah, yeah me too. Uh, mm. Thank you. Yes, mm. very, very important to, 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 to know this and be careful to this because, yeah, architecture could contribute um, significantly to you know, be, be, to being, uh, you know, more open towards each other and uh, to dialogue. And it is uh, also a splendid uh, interior. I mean, sculpturally, you will see some incredible uh, images. Uh, very, very good building, I think. Yeah. And how do you, do you think there's any relationship or any way to tie this in with Constance new Baum? Sorry, Titan with who? A new Babylon project by Constant that we talked about a few days ago. Uh, mm. uh, that's Isn't peripheral, it? but but it but it has that feeling, right? It's lifted up off the ground. All of the yeah. all of the sort of infrastructure is set underground. Yeah, I mean, so so some of the kind of architecture of that we saw of him were very fluid and and yeah i think i think that the underlying thinking is there but the bodies of the buildings are s s different um yeah i mean i have visited this building and 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 you know i i just kind of feel when you, when you are in the building you actually are wowed by by the openness of it as mm. a government building is is quite overwhelming in a way that how free thinking you can be mm. and, and 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 in in um the other works that we saw again that elements of the free thinking is there but in a different way <clears throat> so this actually the, about the... moving i mean this is all about moving your eyes is moving uh 360 degrees because of the kind of curvature of the lines in every direction and 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 that is i think physically and psychologically is very uh, important for 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 human human experience so yeah no but this roof, roof is astonishing so it is actually supported only in the center yeah no, it's, it's supported in various places. In fact, you can even see some of that structure on the bottom left of this diagram when you, of this photograph. Yeah, something is, <laughs> can yeah. be seen there indeed. There's a lot of structural steel here that you're not seeing. Yeah. 
a lot of steel. In fact, you can see that uh, vertical structure in this uh, section here, right? It's expressed shaded in gray. But uh, here, I, I don't see any, I mean. Well, it's a clear span inside the building, that's for sure. So the structure uh, occurs in the middle here and also at the, at the perimeter. Um, associated what you're, with the what you're not seeing is is the form this the wood ceiling and the wood cover of the the vault for the chamber right that's that underside is an undulating steel grid structure that's that's pretty heavy in doing the spanning but it is the form is expressed you just don't see the skeleton hmm. it's clad And, and the entrance is also spectacular and inviting and protecting at the same time. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a good building. Sorry for the resolution. That's how I imported the picture. And, uh, um, excuse me. Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I would like to ask the structural engineer, so the white uh, pin jointed columns, I think, are um, in compression, but are these cables, what, what, ex what, the, what is the function, structural function that they are uh, forming here? They're just keeping the structure stable and any lateral load from wind or seismic or unbalanced, notional, eccentricity, whatever, they keep... They, they brace the structure. So it's like if you imagine you have a tall mast that's pinned at the base, you have to tie it back. So, you know, even if you look outside at your utility poles, like some just come out of the ground and cantilever, but many have guy cables that stabilize them. Mm -hmm, yeah. Does, it, does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 it does. It does. Thank you. So the, the project that they did in Marseille, the courthouse, uh, came before this project, I think. So you can see some references to that. Is that Marseille or Bordeaux? Oh, maybe I have the city wrong. Yeah, yeah. Marseille was I the have, airport. I have here two, uh, two <clears throat> palaces of justice, the mm. law courts of uh, Antwerp in Belgium and also the one in Bordeaux. Bordeaux, Bordeaux, yeah. Yes, I, I love that project. Mm. Uh, but this is in Belgium. We'll arrive at that one too. Mm. I think he's very good at the palaces of justice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And strangely, exactly there in an otherwise, you'd say, you know, rigorous, uh, you know, kind of morose program, he becomes the most adventurous. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> True. But this use of uh, exposed wood is something that you do not see at the... Uh, uh, Court of Human Rights so much. Yes. Mm. And it's not bad here. It's no. Almost if in the chairs were not like this, you would have said this is a church. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and the wood also appears in the, the Madrid airport. Uh, right. I, I think I have uh, I have uh, some some pictures with that airport as well. He just built too yeah, much. But that's, it, it, in Madrid, it's just cladding. It, Antwerp, it's structure. Oh, it's Antwerp, it's structure. Right, right, right. Uh, right, right. I think I'm I don't know if, right do, you, to... do you have the, the recent project for McClellan's single malt? The, the recent, most, the very recent project that we did with Rogers? Where it's like inside a barrel? I don't think I have it now. Oh, that, that's a spectacular one. We have to find Yeah, that's that a one. beautiful wood structure. Beautiful project. 
So you are still co uh, collaborating with him, with, with them? Our firm is very much, yes. Yes. Well, Mohan, if you know the, the Bencomer Tower in Mexico City that Rogers mm. partnered with uh, Legoreto, mm. with Victor, we also partnered with Rogers for the pre-master plan for the Mexico City Airport. Oh, yeah. Okay. And Leonard Groot came out for that several times. Oh, right. He's not a fan, by the way. Leonard. Not a fan of? Of Arab. <laughs> <laughs> He was pleasant. He was pleasant enough. Maybe yeah. it's because of 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 that. Um, it's some history that goes all the way back to Pompidou Center. Oh, would wow. you believe? Yeah. <clears throat> I like this work very much. Um, another Palace of Justice. Yeah. Mm. I think it's very good. Um, it's very good because he also brings in, you know, Arkitab. Some. If, we can, if I could call it some kind of archetypal architecture, uh, almost primitive in a way, and combines mm -hmm. it with these high-tech uh, aesthetics, and the result is very spectacular. Yeah. And Dan, you didn't comment about my question. I was I was directed towards you about whether you see any relation here to New Babylon. I don't know, uh, Bruce. I have to. I have to think about it because I, I, I am a little bit uh, overwhelmed by what I had to do until today. I don't think we can. Uh, we can also uh, discuss and look at the work. Maybe, maybe uh, Raymond Abraham, but uh, I don't know if we can arrive also at uh, Arata Isozaki unless we we are here until mid. I mean midnight here, where I am. Uh, we could, I guess. I don't know. I didn't think of, 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 of a relationship between him and Constant, but the fact that he's a, you know, a forward-looking architect and he's using technology and he's also advocating uh, a certain democracy and he's also, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say a certain, she, he, he is advocating an architecture that is open, that is democratic, uh, and uh, also his adventure aside, I mean, all these aspects connect him with with um, with uh, Constant, yes. But if you want me to say something more specific, I, I have to think uh, after this meeting, and uh, I will let you know. I'm not sure I said something very significant, but I, I tried. Anyway, this this is a, a, a great building. You know, this is not that. Uh, the typical palace of justice at all. And uh, I like the fact that he he became uh, at his most adventurous in a way, uh, exactly within the limits of such a program. Mm -hmm. You know, hats off to the client for uh, giving him the opportunity. Yes, very much so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We sometimes forget, you know, the importance of the client, but, uh, you know, they are paying for the project and, uh, you know, uh, you know, indirectly at least, they are the authors of the project, uh, very mm -hmm. much so. So I remember once I was in New York and there was an exhibition with the paintings of Vincent van Gogh at the Metropolitan Museum. And there was a huge yellow flag with the name Vincent on it, written in blue. And I said, why is it that the, the name of Theo is missing? His brother, because without mm -hmm. his brother, Vincent would not have been able to paint because right. he was never able to earn a living. Mm -hmm. So. I really think the paintings of Vincent, of course he did them, but without them, those paintings would not have come into being. Yeah. And it's very interesting, I mean interesting, it's also very sad, but Theo died shortly after Vincent died and he was younger. So they were one in a way. Mm. And his wife, Theo's wife, I had an intuition, understood that this was a very special relationship between the two brothers, 
because he agreed, she agreed to bury them together. So mm. actually, Theo is buried with, um, entombed with, with Vincent and not with her. Huh. Yes. Now, they, they, this is a very special building. Again, you know, you will say this is the chapel. Yeah. Maybe he wanted to, to infuse, um, you know, these rooms with, with, with this feeling. So you know that when you, when you try to do justice, you, you know, you also have to think in terms that are not only human in a way, you have to respect truth and you have to, to, to you know, to pray almost that you are not making a mistake sometimes, yeah. mm. you know, Taking such de decisions is not easy at mm. all. So that, all that's very interesting about the space detrivializing the the proceedings. Yes, you put it very very well. Thank you. Maybe can I say something? Please. Can I say something sure. about? I, I hope that I will manage with uh, English. It is a, uh, a sacred dimension of the, uh, of the act of justice. Even in the ancient times when they, um, they uh, was in a very primitive way of making justice, uh, they put uh, the, the place of the trials near the temple because mm. they understood that um, uh, the the city has to be in order for instance to the ancient greek greeks they they were uh, seeing the town the the town yes as a cosmos and the cosmos was uh, sacred and sa in a, in a sacred order everything was uh, put it in an order and and they wanted to bring that cosmic order also in the society and this um, this vision of the act of justice, it is uh, take it until our days. That's why they make, for instance, here in Bordeaux, uh, the main the main room in a court of justice is a court. And if you noticed this uh, X form for the room which were uh, for the court they penetrate a little bit the ceiling. I, I've noticed this today on this presentation, looking on, uh, looking on the images. They, they uh, in a way, they are, are uh, plutesque. Domnul Coman, nu știu să traduc. Plutesc deasupra lumii materiale și penetrează un pic acoperișul, intră în relație cu cerul. Mi s-a părut foarte poetic. Okay, so let me translate. You want to say that the lights, the, the light rays uh, uh, penetrate the, the chapel or this room, the court, mm. and uh, they float, these rays float above the, the human beings and kind of remind the people underneath of what is above. That's what you wanted to say? Yeah, that's uh, very valid, I think. You know, by the way of this, uh, Alina, do you want to say something else? Because you, your doctoral paper is on, on uh, palaces of justice, so I'm sure you... Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, she's working on, on her doctoral work on, on palaces of justice. Okay. Alina, do you want to say something else? No. Maybe her microphone is not functioning. But you know, maybe at this point I, I can tell you a short story if you allow me to. I wanted, sure. to. I wanted to participate in the competition for the Palace of Justice in Paris, the one that Renzo Piano won. And uh, my polemical and also my naive and my, my highly naive uh, side wanted to be uh, very confrontational almost with this huge industry in a way. I mean, in the program, they mentioned that thousands of lawyers have to be active to, 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 to function in this huge building. And in fact, the building by Renzo Piano that was built shows very well, uh, you know, the immensity of the, I almost felt like saying that the justice industry 
requires today. So mm. making total abstraction of the, of the program, what I wanted to do because you know that the area where the building by Renzo Piano came into being had to be excavated uh, in order to, to, to build a building. And I thought of using, no, no, there was an industrial building by uh, a famous uh, engineer, um, uh, French engineer, uh, Frenois, Frenois, uh, if I pronounce well his name. And I forgot now that I know the the way excavations required, I'm not sure if on this site or on uh, one adjacent site. So I wanted to use that earth to cover because the, the, the you know, that, that large uh, space built by uh, the French engineer had to be kept. So I, 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 I thought of covering the, 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 how to call it, uh, you know, now I'm beginning to, to, to forget English myself. Uh, in essence, I created a hill mm -hmm. and on that hill, instead of creating the, or proposing the Palace of Justice, Le Palais de Justice, <clears throat> polemically and almost unacceptably so, I wanted to propose La Hutte de, Justi de Justice, meaning the hut of justice. Oh. So, and, and I will explain why. And uh, I, in that hut, on the top of the hill, would, be, would have been an old man, very wise and very old, who distribute justice freely to whoever came to him um, on a, you know, sinuous path that led from the, you know, uh, the sidewalks of Paris right. on the top of the hill. And okay. I, told, <laughs> I told this story. I love that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I told that story to a French woman in, um, in Chicago, and she said, yeah. you know what, you revived the myth of, of St. Louis because Saint Louis is present in every uh, palace of justice in France, is, uh -huh. is the symbol of, uh, of the saintly king who was very just. And so he is really the paradigmatic, uh, you know, justice man, if I can say so. Yeah. I knew nothing about Saint Louis at the time, but that's what I wanted to do. I, unfortunately, I, uh, I abstain from sending a project, um, if we can call it a project. Anyway, a thought I had. Yeah. Okay, but 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 when we look at this room, you know, it's it's almost unavoidable to see this aspect that Alina mentioned yes. and uh, that you uh, Mahadev mentioned. You know, the de-trivialization of mm. what usually takes place in such a place and uh, such a space, and that's because of of of, of the spatial configuration, the dimensions, the verticality of the space, the light. Yeah, I don't, I imagine that Sir Richard Rogers thought about these things. It's hard for me to believe that he didn't. He must have thought of it, yeah. Yes. No, very, very interesting uh, work. Yes, uh, can, I, can, can I say something more? This picture is very relevant for the project because here we can see how the uh, space of the court, they seem that are, as I said, they are fleeting on the normal world. They are a little bit above and also the volume, it's penetrating the ceiling, you know, mm. so it is above, above the ceiling. So it is uh, the... Um, symbol of solemnity of verticality or verticality and also the solemnity of the act of ju justice mm -hmm. and uh, what i find it very very sensitive in this project is that uh, 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 this kind of project has to express the solemnity of the act of the justice but also with uh, the use of the wood uh, they made made uh, this not cold but very human you know mm. very humanistic approach democratic approach not uh, oppressive i don't know if i was very clear but i i tried to transmit uh, an emotion i felt mm. that they come it this very well combines this solemnity with a very sensitive and kind approach to the human being mm. i was clear 
know. Yeah, yes. very clear. Very yes, clear. Uh, Alina, yes. Thank, you. thank you very if, much. Uh, if it is possible, I would like to add something because I was inspired by it, uh, what Alina interpreted. So uh, for me, uh, it's very clear from this view that is a, a kind of play uh, between open and closed. So uh, all the space of the building is open to the city. The city enters the, the building, the building uh, take part to the city. This is uh, what, uh, what you call the democratic aspect of the building. Uh, and in the same time, uh, these courts are closed, are closed and open to the, to the sky. So it's not a, only a solemnic uh, part of, uh, of this architecture, it's, uh, I, uh, I dare to say, sacred. So it's, uh, it's very clear a separation between the uh, life in this world and uh, the sacred life. And uh, the Justice Act is like a sacred act. It's very interesting. And uh, I think uh, after seeing all these buildings, for me, it's the best building of uh, Rochers. Uh, what another thing I, uh, I would say, that uh, in this building, uh, it's uh, a little more architecture from the part of architect because uh, uh, the internal space of this uh, four, five, four, four uh, courts, I, I think. Uh, so they have uh, a kind of shell, a kind of, uh, a kind of, uh, how to say, um, a closing element, which is architecture in, uh, because architecture has double, double function, uh, interior and exterior. And uh, in uh, high-tech architecture, everything is common uh, because the structure uh, is expressing, uh, it's the element to express architecture. Here, it's not anymore only that. Uh, so these uh, courts have their shell, have their uh, double, double uh, surface with the interior and exterior. It's very complex building and I like uh, the most. I want to add a comment here as well. And I'm, I'm not sure, but I believe they had some glazing, technical issues with the glazing with nickel sulfide inclusions, which are things that, you know, break the glass, something in the chemistry of the glass. Um, but I, th I think the point there is that, is that these buildings technically are very complicated. Mm. And you mm. have to have a lot of, sort of, I don't know how, how to say this, it's like, in a lot of ways, these, this, this, these, this architecture is a difficult path to take. It's not the path of least resistance. Yeah. <clears throat> can I, can I just add something here, please, Dan? Uh, sure. You don't have to ask for permission or anything, what? please. What, what is interesting about this kind of approach to the transparency in the design where we play with the body of the building in order to kind of portray a message that, you know, the building is about justice and is about, is, and it is transparent and you can see uh, this is it, this where the, the, the courtrooms are and uh, they are quite open to the viewers. But indeed, if you kind of count the steps that you take to get into these courtrooms, I think you will find them to be very much deep buried within the a space of the building. So although they are kind of, you know, in front of your eyes, but they are not easy to reach. There is more complex, the movement would be more complicated and not so straightforward to get there. So there is a kind of, kind of juxtaposition mm. in, of, of game played in, in that 
yes, it's open, it's transparent, you can see it, but there are barriers and the barriers are very invisible. And uh, so, I, 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 and, and that makes the design very, very exciting in, in, mm. a, in a sense. And it, I think it, it kind of offers a, a, a language there that, you know, did in order to understand the, the aesthetic and the function of the building. And it's, uh, it's kind of uh, the message that it is uh, delivering. You, you need, it, it kind of causes that curiosity to really want to get to know the building inside out, to, to appreciate it. So I, I, I'm finding it very interesting. And, and, and if you allow me, there might be another symbolic level here that in order to arrive into the building, you cross the water. You mm. see, you go above the water and what is water? It's purification. It's mm. purging. So, well, maybe, I'm, maybe we're reading too much into it or I am reading <laughs> too much. But, but I remember I once I did a project myself uh, for the brothers Karamazov and I, I had exactly this, crossing the because it has to do with purging, with cleansing, and in order to ha arrive at that uh, justice, we all want to, uh, or some of us want mm -hmm. to arrive at, um, you know, you, you have to be clean, you have to enter into mm -hmm. the, the courtroom clean, clean mm -hmm. of many things, you know, the temptation of sinning, the temptation of uh, being corrupted and so on. I know, another thought. You know, I think Mr. Richard Rogers uh, is too bad uh, that he, did, he doesn't participate here to hear. <laughs> it would be good to hear from him directly. <laughs> yes, he probably would say, <laughs> what are you talking about? Did, you, did about you invite him, Dan? <laughs> but, but <laughs> did you invite him? No, no, I don't know how to access to him. And, but I, we could send him the recording if he's still functioning. <laughs> He might He's be amused. Quite, he has been quiet recently, hasn't he? He's quite old at this point. Yes, and sadly, he, he, he lost his son a few years ago. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, yes. His son committed suicide about probably five years ago. Mm. And I kind of feel that since then he's been pretty quiet. Um, which is very sad. Hmm. Now we arrive at the, the airport in Madrid, Terminal 4, hmm. uh, which, is, which is good also, and which uses wood, but as, as Bruce said, it's, it's not uh, structurally used, but it's just cladding. Cladding. Hmm. Also a terrific building. Uh, I've been through it uh, on two occasions and uh, enjoyed the experience. Uh, the color is a, as a use of wayfinding. You can see it in this image here mm. that it goes through all the colors of the rainbow from blue all the way to red down at the end of the hall. So each uh, color stands for something, a certain area of the airport? Yeah. Yeah, it's for wayfinding. I mean, if you ever find yourself in a new airport and you look up and it's and you might be in a rush and stressed and it's like, which way do I go? And in your hurry, you might go the wrong way. Whereas this is meant to be like, you just, you know, the color and you just go towards the color. It's calming. I, I thought of proposing something similar for the subway in, uh, in, in New York, you know, to, to use color to immediately identify you know, the direction of, you know, of, uh, I don't know how the subway is now, but <laughs> I had this mm. idea a long time ago that maybe something like that might be need, needed without looking for uh, maps and so on. You I, know? I, I, and I, mm. I really, I really like this picture. It, it, I, I would say again, anthropomorphic, like, you know, how do we use technology and exposed structure, exposed architecture, exposed function that relates to arms and bodies and torsos and heads and fingers and feet. Yes, 
yes, it is, it is good. Um, yes, they are very seductive pictures. Notice those air conditioning uh, ducts or ventilation ducts that yes, stick out and throw very like, like mouths. <laughs> yes, great, uh, great sculptural pieces. Mm. It's always possible to do this. I mean, to propose, uh, you know, any form for, for this function. I mean, not any form, but I think that form. here they've, uh, they've uh, done something that's quite attractive. I mean, uh, in some ways you could think of this as a, as an evolved version of those white tubes that you asked me about at the uh, Pompidou yeah. Center. Yeah. Generally, you can find uh, images about Barajas only on this level in uh, all the uh, magazines. But it's very interesting the level below because the uh, structural elements uh, are very sculptural even to the level below. It's extremely yeah. interesting how, how this uh, system of uh, structural elements uh, are functioning together and being very sculptural. Can I ask who designed the structural form? Does it come from the design of the space and the shape of the roof, or does it come from the, or is it the reverse of that? The, the shape of the roof and the space drives from the structure design. I, I would. If I could respond to that, I would say that every project is unique, every designer. So I don't know what the personalities and the situation for this one, but that it should be a, you know, back and forth. And mm -hmm. I know working with Renzo's um, office, the, the studio, um, you, you, you go from system to detail, back to system, back to detail, back to system, back to detail. So it's, it's a dialogue, it's back and forth. It's not linear. I can appreciate that uh, very much, but what I'm kind of saying is that the, the, the form of the structure as we see here, for example, the kind of the arches that go up, come down, go up, again with a uh, kind of the, the, the columns that supports them. This is something that is in, brought in to an sketch which would be probably one line, two line of the curves of that would uh, well, portrait the, the, the roof. And then the structure engineer would come in and, and put the structure in it. Or was it, does anyone know that this can, can I offer a, maybe a, an insight into this? And it comes from, uh, uh, you know that they did Terminal 5. And it was opened, I don't know, maybe five years ago, something like that. I don't know when it was opened. But they actually Heathrow. won the Heathrow, right? Heathrow, Heathrow, oh. Heathrow Terminal 5. They actually won the Heathrow competition back in 1991. Yeah. Uh, it was a way back. And I was involved in that process right from the beginning up to the time that they won the competition. That was the time just before I came to, uh, to the U.S. Now, if you look at that Heathrow Terminal 5 now, it doesn't bear any resemblance to the early sketches that were done uh, by... At that time, it was John Young, who was one of the partners of Richard Rogers, that did sketches for, for that competition. And if I look at this airport here, I see the hand of John Young in those sketches that were done for the Terminal 5 competition. And it very much started with his three-dimensional sketch of a roofscape that then led to all of the, how do you hold it up? How do you... Uh, do the ventilation, how do you bring light through it and so on. But the starting point was a kind of this drawing of almost, I think he called it a flying carpet uh, that he drew with these waves in it. And uh, that was the sort of uh, starting point. Mm. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. That that is quite useful. Thank you. Mahadev, uh, if you are so kind, do you know the birthday of John Young? No, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> because I think he deserves to be celebrated too. He does, he yes. Does. I think so, yes. <laughs> we have to find out his birthday. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving forward. Great picture, another great picture. Yes, he did some good buildings. I mean, I don't know, uh, Sir Richard Rogers, and, uh, John Young, and whoever works there, uh, you know. But, but you know, this is the thing, that their practice is so open that uh, even the most junior architect is allowed to come up with ideas. And uh, of course, there's this, as, as Bruce described, the meetings every Monday where the, the senior people are overseeing the work and making sure that it's going on the right direction. But they don't insist that only their ideas go into the projects. So even the, the youngest architect can uh, have a, uh, a, a pathway to express their creativity through these projects. Yeah. Tomorrow I fly to London to knock at their door for a job. <laughs> no, because it's beautiful yeah. what you said. Yeah. I mean, that's how it should be, yes. And that's why they, they do good buildings. Yes. Mm. Oh, this is an amazing picture. This one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're very beautiful. Mm. I don't know if uh, their office is aware that somehow some of their works are, uh, you know, uh, dealing almost with um, some kind of a, I mean, the word sacred was already used here. And when I look at this picture, you know, if you make an abstraction of certain things on the, on the, on the floor, you know, it, it could be almost a cathedral. It, mm. So maybe, in some projects at least, they tried, not they, maybe they didn't try, but they arrived at some kind of uh, uh, architecture that is pendulating between uh, the profane and the sacred. And, and mm. because I see this dialogue with, uh, with the above through light and the structure so has, you know, sometimes uh, is some kind of a modern uh, medieval, structure, I mean, the, because of the diagonals and the, uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm inspired, I see, I see here something that is not just, you know, pure modernism, although at uh, Sondre Georges Pompidou it was, but right. in this works is something else. Um, because also the structure becomes a tree, you know, or, or tree-like, which was also you know, uh, in, in Gothic architecture, it was uh, an attempt to, to, you know, the house of court to, in a way, uh, you know, be animated by the, the same principles like in nature. And here also I see some kind of simplified version of that. Yes, you are right. It's uh, like uh, neo-Gothic. Mm. Yeah, it is. It, it does look like kind of neo modern Gothic, definitely. It does give that impression. Calatrava made something. Made something similar in uh, in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about him in a few days. Okay. So now this. Uh, I'm. I'm very curious what uh, uh, Mahadev and Bruce think of, of this building. I mean, what do the engineers think of this building? Well, my first uh, thought for, for this is that this is a building that they did not do with Arab. So it's the disappointment that we didn't get to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> who, 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 who were the engineers? I think Bureau Hapold was the engineer for this. Yeah, uh, 
from an engineering perspective, uh, this is spectacular. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely building. Spectacular. Yeah. yeah. We, we talk about one, one engineer called it the affectionately calls it the giant pin cushion. Hmm. Um, but it, you know, I think what was interesting is they made this huge thing for the millennium and then they couldn't figure out what to put inside of it. Yeah. Uh, which, it was, it was intended almost as a temporary structure, wasn't it at the time? I, I don't know it, if temporary is the right term, but it was, yeah. You know, we, we talked a bit about the Grand Arch at La Défense in Paris. And yeah. There were these images when it was built where Notre Dame would mm. fit within the void yeah. of the Grand Arch. And it was, you know, the, the point that was being made by that is the, the statement about the shallowness of, of contemporary architecture, some contemporary architecture, mm. and that it, it lacked humanity. It lacked, you know, it lacked a, a sense of joy. And I think... There, there was something about, well, and it could just be like Mahadev said, just being jealous that it, it wasn't our project because mm -hmm. it's so spectacular. But there, there is some sort of something going on that, you know, you make this huge thing and then you can't figure out what to put inside it. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was time that uh, for, for a long time, there were a lot of debates about kind of demolishing it, and dismantling it. But um, yeah, it changed. Now it is a big venue for um, concerts and events, mm. which is very successful. Um, may, it, 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 the, the area itself is very interesting. So yeah. Yes. Mm. It's quite something. I mean, I, I was involved in doing a master plan for the whole of this area and, and just the location of this dome i remember having allocated it for uh, just to be open as an open space for mm. public uh, but then later it became the dome so um which is yeah is is it, it is successful now it's okay but what is happening inside now is there a stadium or what uh, it is kind of concerts, uh, is a big venue for variety of events. You know, you get a lot of exhibitions or um, concerts, musical concerts. And yeah, sort of events take place. So it doesn't have a unique function? It is no, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't have a unique function. It is called the Otuna. Um, yeah. It's the Otu Arena. Uh, very well done. Yes. Yeah, very nice. I don't know about this. <laughs> That's one of the exhibits. <laughs> right. Yeah. How did it get in? Is there such a big opening in the, the building to bring something or it was assembled there from parts? Yeah, probably assembled from parts. <laughs> I, I haven't been inside, but you know, just looking at the images and the drawings and what I've studied of the project, I, I love the scale of the columns and the way that the, they're spaced and latticed columns. I think it's, they're exquisite. But I wonder about, like, especially when we compare to what we looked at for Barajas, I wonder about how you experience these bases. You can see it sort of in the bottom right corner and, and these um, quadrupods that pick up the base of the columns and the cables coming in. Uh, I just... I wonder if it's as effective as kind of anthropomorphic sculpture that people interact with. And, you know, there's some, there's such large forces coming through here. Do you, do you, do you sense it and do you feel it or is it somewhat cold and a little too industrial? Um, well, I visited this building kind of uh, many, many years ago, so I don't very much remember it, but the, the you do you do kind of get close to this 
elements. They, they kind of draw you towards the, themselves in, in, the, in the fact that they are so huge. And, uh, you know, you want to see, you know, how they've been put together and things like that. But I don't know how, you know, an ordinary man in the street who, who is not, an architect or a designer or an engineer would kind of react to them. But, you know, it's, uh, they are sculptures and, uh, mm. you know. You yeah, I'm just su suggesting that even though they're sort of bright yellowy orange, goldenrod mm. color, you know, super warm color, that they feel to me cold. They don't have that excitement like the Pompidou the Gerberettes at the Pompidou or some of the other projects we looked at, you know, especially the sculptural qualities of Barajas. Yeah. That I cannot comment on. Sorry. Um. Okay. Now we arrive at the last, uh, I mean, the present day uh, mm. term. And uh, I'll show a few works. Uh, the British Museum, the World Conservation and Exhibition Center, uh, which is a much more subdued and, and uh, you know, Cartesian building. Maybe as a gesture of respect for the old building, I don't know. Uh, it's, it has very fine details and it is, uh, you know, it, it is refined. I almost think of a Danish architect uh, of the international style movement, Arne mm. Jakobsen. It's very, you know, a, a, in a way almost atypical for Sir Richard Rogers. Mm. Do you know when when his son uh, uh, left uh, left this life? You know, you mentioned because maybe you know the the, the death of his son provoked a change in him. I, I don't know. I I can't remember exactly. I think it was about three years ago. Ah, so no, not too long ago. It's not long ago. No. Um, I think it's perhaps much more to do with the, the new, uh, the making of the new partners because Graham Sturck and Ivan Harbour were very young architects in his practice. And in some ways, he actually skipped a generation to pick, uh, pick them to be the standard bearers for the practice into the future. And uh, knowing the ethos of, uh, or having experienced the way in which they worked, I'm sure that as soon as they were made as uh, as the the leading partners in the firm, he must have given them a lot of freedom to now set the new direction for the for the partnership. That's what I would expect. Dan, I uh, I've got here that Bo Rogers died after suffering a seizure in France, both last year, and this was written on the 13th of November of 12, 2012. So it would be on 2011. Hmm. So almost a decade ago. Yeah. <clears throat> Very refined uh, detailing here. Now, uh, some apartment buildings uh, near yeah. Hyde Park, uh, I imagine. Uh, yeah. you know. Rumors. Mm. Rumors have it there are some serious detail uh, problems with them. And they're kind of, yeah, dispute court cases, I think. Why? Mm, I, I, I don't um, know so much of the details and I think there are kind of confidential that is involved with it or something like that, but um, yeah, I've just heard it. 
But again, this is not the traditional Rogers, right? No. These are very, very expensive apartments. Yeah. In the cost of one point fifteen billion. Wow. Mm. And they are the most expensive apartments in Hyde Park. Now, what is uh, moving me is that they built this very expensive uh, housing complex, but then, at least on Wikipedia, the latest, the last two works are the ones that I'm going to show now which are destined to homeless people and uh, to very, very, um, you know, uh, I mean, people without, uh, without means. <clears throat> this is done for 36 single uh, homeless people. And mm -hmm. I really like the fact that, uh, you know, Sir Richard Rogers, you know, uh, took such a job and, uh, you know, tried to do the best. To have a, a good architect and with a famous uh, past and uh, with a lot of glory to also, uh, you know, uh, apartment buildings for the, the least privileged uh, people, I think is, is very, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, is, is uh, inspiring actually. Mm. And, you know, I, I don't know of, uh, you know, Zaha didn't do it. Rem Kolhas didn't do it, Bernard Chumi didn't do it, uh, uh, Peter Eisenman didn't do it, uh, Daniel Lipskin didn't do it, uh, Norman Foster, I don't think he did it, but Sir Richard Rogers did it, and he's not the only one. We'll see the last work. Also, working for really uh, very inexpensive uh, housing, and yet we are talking about a star architect, and I like this fact that. Uh, star architect, as, as he's called, or as they are called, uh, finds uh, interest in something like this. I, I think this is very, um, I don't know, encouraging in a way. When the architect also assumes a certain social function that is, you know, uh, probably without uh, glittering, uh, uh, you know, uh, glory, but it's perhaps this that makes me think uh, what Mahadev said that he's, um, he was a modest man when he built it. Mm. And I think without uh, you know, attempting to idealize him excessively, but I, you know, I didn't know that that complex, of course they looked expensive, those in Hyde Park, but the same architect did those um, uh, you know, expensive uh, uh, blocks of flats and and these buildings. And I don't know, I, I, in a way it shows his complexity and, and his generosity. So Actually, can I read something that I just found on their website? Please. So this is, uh, this says, contributing to society through charitable donation is fundamental to the practice. So when Roger Stirk Harbor and Partners was set up, the beneficial ownership of the group was given to a charity company. So it's actually owned by a charity, the entire practice, which is now called the Roger Stirk Harbor and Partners Charitable Foundation. And it gives you the charity registration number and all of that. And it says here every year that the, uh, the group is profitable under the rules of our constitution, the partnership allocates 20% of pre-distribution profits to the charity. And that in the past six years, over three million pounds has been given to the charity. And then they have a long list of their charitable activities. So this was built for or and by the foundation, their foundation? I, no, I don't know anything about this project. I just wanted to shed some light on their ethos. 
very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we arrive at the last work, uh, which is also, uh, and here I have some uh, some text explaining what is happening is a temporary housing complex, as it was described, Ladywell pop-up village in London. So is the UK's first pop-up village with temporary homes, a cool cafe, a thriving indoor market, and work. Pardon? Um, a thriving indoor market and workspace for entrepreneurs and charities. The resident takes a peek at this cool new community hangout. This was a newspaper that published this material. When Lady Well Leisure Center was demolished in 2014, uh, Lewisham Council, Council decided to put a site to good use instead of leaving a yawning gap in the high street while new build, uh, build and new estate regeneration programs were being developed for the site. The council worked with architects Roger Sturk and Harbour and Partners to create place, Ladywell, a Lego bright temporary residential development, offering a short term solution to the housing crisis in the borough. Mm. And here is a drawing, uh, and um, we'll arrive at a few more explanations. Uh, so this is. Um, temporary, very inexpensive uh, form of housing, which combines also is not just housing, but there are also other functions, uh, market and uh, certain, um, you know, uh, boutiques or ateliers. And it, apparently it has a lot of success. I read that uh, uh, where people uh, gathered there. I think it, I, this has something to do with him, with his, uh, Maybe even with his uh, incapacity to read until 11, because I mm. think he has some empathy, some compassion. And I also uh, recall the word modesty that was uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, attributed to him. And so I read, Good Hope is the second site for the cafe that runs to raise funds for the charity for Jimmy. The original site in Heather Green is currently undergoing refit following a, a flood. And now you see a room. Of, so there are social spaces, social functions in this complex. And it's so very different from, from those buildings, uh, you know, near Hyde Park or in mm. Hyde Park. Then the indoor market that plays Lady Well includes the Thunder and Lightning <clears throat> Fashion Boutique run by Morgan Weber Newman. Uh, so she, she always wanted to have a patient boutique and now mm. she got the chance of her life, uh, you know, to, to and you can you can tell she's happy with simple yeah. means, you know, with a little bit of plywood. She's, she's having her, her uh, patient boutique. Then mm. a florist run by, it's interesting also that the names are given, the name of this happy, people who, who, who have this chance now to, to, to flourish in a mm. way, and not just because this one is a florist, run yeah. by Anne-Marie Lichmore, or, uh, Lichmore, who sells both silk and real floral ar arrangements. Mm. I, I, I like this return to humanity, you know, to simple gestures, to, in a way, yeah. you know, almost moving away, in a way, from, from high-end architecture towards life, simple life, and an Italian del deli, we love pasta, run by Sicilian Corrado Scala, selling homemade, uh, I get hungry now, selling homemade. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> organic, it's lunchtime here. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> organic sauces, ice cream and more. And look at it, this is the, yeah, the beautiful. deli. <laughs> and I think now we arrive at the last image. There is also a bring and fix inviting people so that's how it is called bring and fix inviting people to share their skills fix bikes bikes and more very very nice i i i, I really felt like ending this presentation with 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 this uh, yeah that was good mm. yes so that's it
Well, thank you very much. I don't know if we probably it's too too late to to continue with uh, Raymond Abraham. We can we can uh, celebrate. Uh, yeah, I fear we have used uh, used the time, but uh, I think in a very fruitful way. Yes, very much. Your your, your yeah. conversation, the dialogue, the interventions. I think it was very very nice. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. The, thank you for setting it up. One. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, it helped us so much, the students. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you for your time. Okay, okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> you are so yes. happy that it ended. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. thank you all. Raymond will have to wait for another day. Right, thank you very much, Mahadevan <laughs> and Bruce. Okay. Truly, uh, it thanks. was very, very nice that you participated. Have a nice no, thank, lunch. Thanks for lunch. setting it up, really good. So, Have a uh, nice lunch. Enjoy mm. some Italian something, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, all the best. Till next time. The same. Thank you. All yeah, the best. Bye. 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 Dan, thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. It was very interesting. Did you know about uh, the um, logo exhibition that? Uh, Richard Roger organized at the uh, RA in London. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I do not. <coughs> so, about two years ago, he had this massive uh, Lego, Lego exhibition at the RA, which was immensely successful with uh, adults and children going there and just playing with the logos and building things and you know making models and all that sort of thing so and it, it was full of activities and colors and an amazing amazing uh, exhibition and you may find images of it on the google if you google it and you'd see that the, the colors of that he uses on his buildings, you know, these kind of primary colors, they're kind of, they drive from, you know, logos in a way. So uh, there, there is a lot to kind of take parallel from uh, what he, as a child, kind of used to play with and now as a grown up in his buildings. Um, and what I like about his buildings are that is that they are in a scale they are quite large, but as you walk around them, you you are not intimidated by their scale, and they are quite in a way uh, articulated both in their volumes and the break of the volumes and the in the in the elevation treatments, and so to bring them down to human scale in 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 the way that you know they don't become quite overpowering but you know you're aware of of the size but by the use of the colors and the uh, the, the way that he articulates the you know the the, the facades and the the volumes it, he achieves something quite remarkable in relating you know a, a big structure into a human scale. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to ask you, uh, the ones who are still here, isn't it, uh, for me, it's very moving that these two engineers made time to be with us because they are very, very accomplished uh, engineers. Mahadev was the director of Ove Arup America and the director of the Architectural League. In fact, I wanted to ask him, but I forgot because he's actually, and both are very involved with architecture. You saw here two engineers who have very uh, uh, legitimate comments, even in the field of aesthetics. And I don't think it's an accident that Mahadev was uh, director of the Architectural League in New York, which is an organization, of course, dedicated to, to architecture and architects. And um, so it, it really moves me that, um, you know, two people like them, uh, you know, uh, spent with us three hours 
to uh, almost four hours, no, three hours, to, you know, look carefully at the works by uh, Sir Richard Rogers and, uh, you know, some works that they actually were involved with. In some of them, they, they were part of the teams. So uh, th this is really, uh, uh, for me, uh, very, very uh, uplifting. And uh, I think we need, you see, this kind of dialogue, which is not institutionalized, which is, uh, you know, informal and spontaneous and heartfelt. I think, I think such a dialogue is very, very useful. Don't you think? Yes, I, I think so then. It's always good to have uh, this kind of inputs. Yes, it was very interesting what I've heard this evening. Very interesting. Yeah, well, I, I prepared also. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I struggled a lot to finish uh, the, the Raymond Abraham uh, presentation because the one I had, I lost. So I had to make a new one. And the one on Arata Isozaki uh, I had, but I, I, I had to do some changes because, you know, you make a presentation now and one year later, in the meantime, the architect builds other three or five buildings. So you are always behind. So if you want to keep updated, uh, you need to, <laughs> to keep working on the PowerPoint presentation. But what is good about birthdays is that, you know, they will, they will pop up again next year. So, you know, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I mean, now I'm a little bit tired and you are probably tired too. I don't think you, you have the desire to hear uh, another talk about Raymond Abraham and, uh, and uh, Rata Isozaki. But I am prepared. I mean, I know to Mohammed, Mahad, Mahad, I always have difficulties to pronounce his name, unfortunately, Mahadev, uh, because his name is a little bit, almost sounds a little bit Russian, but he's not Russian. So that's why I'm a little bit confused. Mahadev, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> with that last image, one of those two last images with food, I think, uh, you know, he became. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> hungry. Anyway, so what should we do? Should we say goodbye to each other, or should we continue the dialogue, or what do you what do you propose? Hello. I, I think for me today, uh, I need to do other stuff as well. Uh, for me, if you don't mind, I, I, I will leave. Okay, but David. Feel free to carry on if you sure, must. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. No, I, I want to end with that. Thank you. Okay, see you. See you. What about the others? Hello? <laughs> yes, I, I was thinking, I was thinking what to say. I mean, if you want, I, I could in 20 minutes to show you um, uh, Raymond Abraham. It's not such a long uh, presentation and if we don't have uh, too many conversations, I think in, in, in 20 minutes, uh, we can we can go through his work. Do you want to? Yes, Dan, continue. I okay. know, you are always present, always fresh. You'll, you'll never get tired. I like this. You are even... Preparing my presentation for this Saturday, uh, I have to present my uh, works uh, in our Rotary uh, business group. Okay. So it's going on side by side. Okay, so I'll show you quickly uh, Raymond Abraham, who was a very uh, interesting architect and very admired by many. Uh, he was Austrian. He died in 2010. 
and but he was famous in uh, New York City because he he taught at Cooper Union, where he also taught um, that, well even Daniel Lipskin that he he was a student there and then Lebia Suz and Peter Eisenman and uh, John Haydock and so on. This is the man, <laughs> of course, with a cigar like so many architects. He died in a car accident, actually, in Los Angeles. Uh, but he was, I think, 76 or so, always with a hat on his head. He was born and raised and educated in Austria. And uh, a very intense man, and he drew in a very, very personal way, and you see plenty of drawings. I have this book. It was given to, to us, in fact, in Austria, in, uh, in Vienna, by uh, the very generous Institute of Architecture. They gave us so many books, you just won't believe it. Anyway, this was published by the Institute of Architecture in Vienna. Now some drawings by him. Now his drawings, I would say, I would argue to use the, the academic jargon, uh, are even more important than his buildings. He didn't build so much, in fact, if you go to Wikipedia, you know, one third of the buildings that, you know, it is claimed that, 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 that he built them cannot be found. So <laughs> I'm not sure he, he, he built them. I, I, I really search hard to find everything, every single building he built. This is a bank actually, and it was built this one. But I want to show you the drawings because they are very, very particular to him. And once you see a few, you'll realize uh, that these are drawings by uh, Raymond Abraham. He spent more time drawing than, uh, than anything really. He loved to draw and he drew manually, you know, with colored pencils. Uh, and he envisioned, uh, you know, impossible architectures and, and so on. Um, his drawings are exquisite and, as I said, uh, very specific to him. Of course, uh, there are books written about his drawings. <clears throat> Much can be speculated in looking at his drawings. You know, they are abstract, they are, you know, uh, they show even, I would say, some kind of uh, uh, post-apocalyptic uh, architecture, if I can call it so. Um, not all of them really make too much sense uh, from a structure. I mean, it's very different from Sir Richard Rogers, who, who was a builder. You'll never see such a drawing from Sir Richard Rogers, never. Um, So again, for him, the drawing, I think, is more important than the actual building. Although he did build a few works, and I'm sorry that uh, Mahadev left because he was actually the engineer for the big uh, uh, Austrian cultural center in New York. But maybe one day he will join us again and we can uh, talk about this building with him. Then was that breaking of a cube, uh, the previous one, the previous slide? It shows a breaking of a cube, maybe? I guess, even, yes. Even the one previous to this, I think, shows that. Well, he imagined all kinds of things, you know, utopia on Earth. Uh, but also some kind of dystopia in a way, or not dystopia, but there is a certain pessimism also, if we can, I mean, I don't know if I 
express myself correctly, but the presence of death or of memory is uh, not neglected. Then you see also parts that are underground. Now we arrive at the building where uh, Mahadev was the, the lead uh, uh, engineer and he knew personally uh, Raymond Abraham and worked with him. But even for this building, which was built, he uh, drew these exquisite drawings. Maybe after the building was completed, or I don't know, but uh, these are not working drawings. They are not, they find fin finality in, in, in themselves. These are kind of presentation drawings made by the architect for the architect, I would say. Not so much for the client, for the pleasure of drawing architecture. And that's how the building, I mean, this is the building. You see it here, very narrow. And Mahadev told me that uh, they had a lot of difficulties with this building. I imagine from the point of view of mechanical engineering, structural, I don't know. The site was very, very narrow, but it was built as he imagined it. It's quite a tall building, but very narrow, as you can see. But in, 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 in general terms, you could say that he was a speculative <coughs> architect as uh, using the word speculative in a British way, in, a, in, a, in an American way, or maybe British too, meaning, uh, you know, uh, an architecture of ideas. But he was able still to create a building that is so different from the one on the left and one on the one on the right and the one uh, across the street and so on. There are certain mannerisms here and I'm not totally convinced by him. I mean, uh, all this re repetitive and that, 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 that there are certain formal elements that repeat themselves uh, almost obsessively. Now these are the floors, so if you can read them of the of the whole building or of uh, part of the building, maybe not the whole because there are just um, you know eighteen floors. I, I don't know how tall it is. Maybe around that. I don't know. Um, but in a very commercial uh, city, you know, with uh, many co commercial buildings, he tried to do something that was not commercial at least at the level of, uh, you know, image. Of course, between the two drawings, I mean, the one on the left and the one on the right, I prefer the one on the left because artistically is more sensitive and uh, yeah, more, more sensible. It would have been nice to hear Mahadev, what he had to say about this building but probably we'll have uh, another chance to, to, to talk with him. And uh, this is the architect, <laughs> obviously. Um, and um, incredibly big is this city, you know, Manhattan. I mean, when you look at it, you know, this, these buildings go forever and ever upwards. Now, this is a building in Berlin uh, on the famous Friedrichstrasse where there are buildings by Jean Nouvel, Rem Kolkas, Aldo Rossi, Peter Eisenman, and here he is. It's an apartment building. <clears throat> now, those diagonal elements are neither structural nor, uh, nor do they hide behind some stairs. So I guess they are rather, you know, without the uh, function except the decorative one or the ornamental one. But they are kind of interesting, although he, he, he works with symmetry, uh, uh, you know, constantly.
but there is a there is a round courtyard. I was myself surprised when I discovered this that I didn't expect, uh, you know, uh, a round a circular courtyard uh, or backyard uh, when you see that facade. I guess he wrote a book, Elementary Architecture. Um, anyway, a picture from that courtyard or backyard. Um, so um, this is on Friedrichstrasse in Berlin, and then it's a, a private residence, uh, rather big, or maybe moderately big, um, in Austria. It's interesting that he works a lot with symmetry and symmetry was kind of discouraged by, uh, you know, some orthodox moderns. This is a bank, you saw the drawing before, and uh, no, no, there is another bank, uh, or this is the back view, perhaps, I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, it's the back view, the Tyrol bank, you saw the drawing for this facade, and this is the back, um, it's back, uh, quite different now from the buildings on the left and on the right. This is the drawing that you saw. But it still sits there somehow. Maybe you wouldn't expect it to be a bank because it's almost a cross on the facade. But uh, now this is an interesting building, but it was built after he died from his plans, the House of Music in Austria. This is the building and it has various functions, you know, uh, you know, rehearsal rooms and even uh, some housing, uh, you know, for traveling musicians, I guess. But the, 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 you know, the aesthetics of the building and the, the space of the building are not to be ignored. He does work with the primal uh, geometric figures, you know, the triangle, the square, um, the, the, the triangle, the circle, the square. You see the plan. It's a citadel in a way, a fortress, the fortress of music. It's not so large, but uh, it has personality. Again, this was built after he died. He died in 2010. This was built three years later. Now, he believed in the reality of the unbuilt. And maybe not too many architects believe in the reality of the unbuilt, but he did. And this is a subject, you know, worth uh, talking about, perhaps the reality of the unbuilt and this was an exhibition within the house of music i i think actually it was called just that the reality of the unbuilt now this is a tower 
proposed for New York City, which was never built. And I unrealized project by Ab Abraham for a structure on Delancey Street on the Lower East Side Manhattan. On what direction is architecture moving? Architecture moves towards itself to dissolve in itself, to become speechless for the sake of silence, yet filled with a desire to signify its solitude, silent, unknown sign, in the written image, immutable, in the drawn image, unspeakable, in the built image, uninhabitable. The mystery of these images becomes the myth of the journey of architecture and the odyssey of the imaginary inhabitants who attempt to decipher them. He did believe, and I think this is actually a limit of his architecture, he did believe in uninhabitability. And uh, as opposed to the last work by uh, Sir Richard Rogers, which brought joy to the people who live there, this gentleman is rather misanthropic. The song of the sirens, of course, is very poetical and so on, but uh, the presence of death, I think, is, uh, is uh, apparent. Behind the words, he doesn't use the word death, or this author doesn't use the word death, but uh, what is uh, un the unspeakable, the immutable, and the uninhabitable. We are talking about death here. And, uh, but it's interesting. I mean, you look at this uh, fragment of a tower, it, it, it looks interesting. It's a monument indeed speaking about the unspeakable, the immutable, the uninhabitable. And two other unrealized projects, we are approaching the end. Um, uh, Beijing Center for Wellbeing. Uh, a little hard to see what's going on here, but I couldn't find it. Maybe I have another picture. Um, a little hard to see what's going on. And uh, <clears throat> the World, World Trade Center New York, Ground Zero, Bird's Eye View, also here is a little uh, almost impossible to, uh, to see. Uh, I apologize. And then again, the Ground Zero, the World Trade Center, New York, the World Towers. It's a, you know, a proposal for the competition uh, for the World Trade Center, the Ground Zero. Um, and um, a hinge chair, even the chair he designed is uh, so telling of him. Look, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's a chair uh, divided, you know, with a rift broken, broken in the middle, you know, and it's so typical of him. Even the back, you see, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's broken in the in the middle. But this is the ideology and the aesthetics of uh, Cooper Union in general. He was not the only one working kind of in this in this way. This is some kind of a reflection again on on death, on dissolution, on on the rift, on departure on separation, it's about separation. Uh, you know, it's a moment of crisis. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if I would sit very gladly on this chair, you know, but uh, anyway, as a piece for uh, thinking, it's a chair for thinking, not for sitting. And as a chair for thinking, I think it's fine. Uh, you could say it's a chair for a divided being for the double within some of us, at least. There is also a certain level of self-indulgence here in the speculative work, you know, but anyway, now you see his project for the New York Times Tower. He won that this competition and I took myself part in this competition and you'll see my drawing, which you did, which I didn't win, um, but he won it. Uh, I suspect he also won it because uh, his good friend was the chief of the jury, John Haydock, and that helped a little bit. I am not just trying to give a cheap shot to his success, but I don't think his work was so good. I'll show it to you. So here you have the Times Tower. What he did, he just stacked theaters very mechanically, one above the other, identical theaters, you see the sloping uh, slab for the chairs, 
Uh, so because this is an area with uh, cinemas and theaters, he just put them one above the other, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, I, I found it mechanical and, uh, you know, not, not uh, sufficiently interesting as an architecture. But he won. And uh, I'll show you now what I did. So again, this is his project with his stacked theaters one on top of the other. And this is what I did. I didn't mention my name here, but it's my work. I, I was, uh, I don't know, 30, 32 years old then when I did this. This is the, this, this was my drawing, my drawing, my participation in the project. And uh, I will I'll explain in, in short what, what I thought. I proposed two towers, the red one and the white one. Now, the, the, the site, the building site was uh, like an hourglass. Here you had Broadway and 7th Avenue intersecting exactly at 45th Street. So the competition asked only for the Times Tower, which was at South. But because I, I, I like uh, clepsidras or hourglasses and the, and the, and the building site or the, the site plan, the site plan is like an hourglass because here you have 48th Street, here you have 42nd Street. So there are six streets between uh, each other and exactly in the middle at 45th Street, they intersect. In fact, this intersection is called the crossroads of the world. That's how New Yorkers call the intersection between 40 feet, between Broadway and 7th Avenue. So, because I, I like, as I said again, uh, the, 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 the site plan, I propose two towers, not just one. The competition asked for one, Times Tower. But I proposed also another building in, lieu, uh, in, in, in the place of the Coca-Cola building. Here it was existing the Coca-Cola building. So I proposed the red tower and the white tower. Why? Because at that time I was reading Architecture and Alchemy, no, uh, uh, Psychology and Alchemy by Carl Jung. And I was fascinated by um, Carl Jung's theories about uh, uniting the opposites. The red, the, the, the king with the queen, uh, fire with water, the sun with the moon, sulfur and mercury. And so at south, because it is south, I propose the red tower, this one, for the masculine principle or for the king. And here at 48th Street, I propose the white tower for the queen or the feminine principle, uh, also being north, because of course the south is connected with the sun, and the north with the moon. And, and, and the queen or the feminine principle is connecting with the moon and, and, and the sun is connected, with, I mean, and, and, uh, and the fire is connected with the sun, being also the king. So I imagine the king and the queen, fire and water, the sun and the moon, uh, red and white, because in uh, European alchemy, the red symboli is symbolized symbolizes fire and, 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 and the male or the masculine principle and whiteness symbolizes the queen. So, and in front of each tower, I imagine two very, very large urban chairs. You can see here, but I think I have a detail a little further on. So again, here you see clearly the red tower and the white tower. Uh, and uh, you can see the, cut spheres in front of the tower, which are huge urban chairs. On the white half of the world sits the Red King, symbolizing fire and south and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the sun. And on the red half of the world sits the White Queen uh, and uh, symbolizes the water and the moon. And uh, uh, you can see here, you know, enlarged a little bit how these urban chairs would have been. 
few scale, you know, I mean, you know, a human being would have been able to walk through behind, underneath the chair of these mythical figures, which I try to, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, to express through this uh, a little bit expressionistic uh, drawing. But it was, you know, conceptually or uh, maybe a little bit uh, schematically an attempt to unite the opposites and the two halves of the world. You know, the white one, the feminine with the masculine, the moon with the sun and fire and water. And uh, the, the, it's impossible to read the text, but it, it, I kind of explained or I tried to explain what I was attempting here. And so you see, uh, in, in, the pers in the pastel drawing, I only show the red tower, meaning the times tower. But it's not difficult to imagine how the Coca-Cola building would have looked or the White Tower because it essentially schematically would have been um, approximately the same. Uh, so also one last thing, if you, if you, uh, um, how to say, if you, uh, I forgot the word, if you uh, project the tower on the site plan, both towers, actually, the projection on the on the side coincides with their height, so they would have met exactly at the crossroads of the world, right here at 45th Street. That's it. But <laughs> maybe too many explanations. Uh, I didn't win anything, but I'm not ashamed of this work, although it is rather conceptual or schematic. That's all. Thank you very much. I showed you uh, also the presentation on Raymond Abraham, but now please do not ask me to show you the one on Arata Isozaki because I don't think I don't think I can do it because it's also a very um, it's it's a big one. Anyway, now you know a little more about me. You know, with my fantastic uh, preoccupations. That didn't bring me any success because uh, you know you can imagine you know, talking to a bunch of architects about uh, you know the uh, European alchemy and, and you know fire and water and uh, all the rest. But I did it at one time. So should we say goodbye or do you have anything to comment or to say? Please, yeah, in, the buildings, buildings of Raymond, in the buildings of Raymond, uh, I felt the cross cross was uh, quite prominent in some, some way. I don't know. Was he a staunch Christian or something? No, I don't think he was a Christian at all. Uh, he, loved, uh, he, loved the, he loved the cross. I mean, what can we say? Um, no, I, I don't think he was Christian. No, I think he was Jewish, but he liked the he liked the cross, and uh, yeah, it's very present in most of his works. It's true. No, an, an interesting architect, uh, especially his drawings were very valued, and uh, you know, people uh, have high regard for him as a visualizer of uh, architecture, if we can call him so. But once I wrote, uh, when I attended the conference by him, I, I wrote uh, an essay on him. Uh, uh, but at that time, I was criticizing everybody. So I, I also had some issues with him. Uh, anyway, maybe some other time I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll send you the that essay that I wrote many, many years ago. It was a great presentation today. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Well, uh, I know, Vatsal. Vatsal, please one day surprise me and say it was not a nice presentation. I'm very disappointed Then I, I don't know. For a few days at least, I will not show up. I uh, better do something else. <laughs> Okay, uh, Vatsal, please do not forget, one day we are going to visit you in Ahmedabad, so. Sure, most uh, welcome. 
again, I don't know why. I, I, now I feel like eating Indian food and uh, it's impossible here with the pandemic. Anyway. Okay, anyone else wants to say something or should we say good night? Good night, night evening. I was wondering in your project uh, with the towers, if um, in the two seats, the one of the north and the one of the south, if those were statues or people would, uh, uh, would uh, sit on them? Impossible, Andre, to sit on them because I told you they were huge, yes, sculptures. I mean, oh, so there's, okay, I understand. I liked your proposal because um, it's somehow very archetypal uh, with those. Uh, in fact, there are pyramids which uh, have this uh, ancient connotation, and also they are turning to uh, skyscrapers. And also, this uh, combination of the duality south north, uh, I mean, this uh, relationship with the sun and uh, the astronomy. Let's say astronomy. Yeah, well, as I said, because I was reading this book and I truly recommend you this book, it's an excellent book by Carl Jung, Psychology and Alchemy. And all the book is about this, trying to, because the claim of Carl Jung was that the true alchemists, they were actually not interested in the vulgar girl. They were not interested to, to to make uh, out of lead uh, money or gold. No, they were working on their own soul. So they try to, because it is said that we are kind of half human beings. And because, uh, you know, once we left paradise, you know, we are searching for the other half and we are never complete. So it was a quest for completion, for wholeness. And they did that through very sophisticated and esoterical uh, procedures, but in essence was about trying to unite symbolically fire with water, the sun with the moon, sulfur and mercury, uh, the north with the south, the king with the queen, and yeah, somehow that uh, site plan, I felt that, uh, you know, would have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, I am tired. I don't find the words. Um, yeah, well, you, well you, anyway, you saw it. It, 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 it just uh, was, was uh, auspicious for, for this kind of um, reasoning. So, uh, yeah, I proposed two towers, but uh, as I it said... It was already uh, symmetric, the site, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. very symmetric, but not only that there is a symmetry, it's an intersection and exactly at half. Yes. Uh, you know, between 42nd Street, which is very famous in Manhattan, and 48th Street. And uh, the two very important avenues, Broadway and 7th, intersect exactly at 7th Avenue, at, at, at 45th Street. So at equal distance from 48th. And in between them, there are no other buildings in that uh, uh, site plan. There are, even now, there are two buildings but they are not related in any way, uh, you know, philosophically or conceptually or you name it. But there are, at this very moment, there are two buildings there. I try to, to relate them to, 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 to uh, I, I thought in urban terms, I didn't think just about one building. And uh, anyway, yeah. Okay. And I also wanted to add something about the entire presentation of today that I found really interesting to have a short glimpse in the strong work ethic that uh, those engineers from, um, uh, yeah, we saw today had uh, in their collaboration with the great architects uh, they worked with, uh, because it's something very rare to see today uh, such passionate um, engineers who, as you said, have uh, aesthetical tastes and judgment and uh, uh, you will never, I mean, I don't think you can find something like this today in uh, Romania. And, and well, it was really interesting, for example, what they said about those uh, Monday meetings when they discussed uh, the projects, uh, even if uh, in, in the contracts, there were, there were other uh, engineers uh, 
but it was a sort of uh, friendship, a sort of circle uh, of knowledge, uh, despite the business itself, which produced um, the great buildings they produced, actually, from this collaboration. But you know, both of them are exceptional um, engineers. I mean, you know, if you look on the, on on the Wikipedia or on on the net, on the web, at what at what projects Mohammed contributed, some of them, the most uh, notorious buildings in the past uh, 30, 40, 50 years, and uh, Bruce also, they both worked with Peter Rice, who was considered and is considered a genius in, in, in the field of uh, structural engineering. He did engineering at the Opera in Sydney. He did engineering at the Glass Pyramid by IMP. He did engineering at Lloyd's, the building that we saw today. He, saw, he did engineering at um, uh, La Grande Arche in Paris. So we are dealing here, but you saw them. I mean, these people named the partners of Sir Richard Rogers, and I mean, they, they knew these people. They worked with them. That's why, that's why I'm mad that the Minku doesn't realize what it loses by by not taking advantage of such chances. You know, this was a chance, you know, to, to hear two very generous and at the same time, very modest engineers, because you remember what, what the Mahat, Mahat, Mahadev said that, you know, or Bruce said and Mahadev agreed that uh, upon that, uh, you know, they kind of want the architect to be the dictator, meaning to take you know, to, to take the initiative and to, 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 to be the, the leader of the group. And, you know, uh, I, I admire them for this because you saw they are very articulate, uh, very cultured. I mean, Bruce talks about, uh, you know, many cultural issues. He, these are not ordinary engineers. And Mahadev actually was, Bruce said, was his mentor. So Bruce considered Mahadev his mentor. And if Bruce is like this, you can imagine how Mahadev is and was. And we don't have to imagine any longer because we saw him uh, today talking uh, in a very, very articulate way. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was a pleasure, really. And, and these engineers are more than just so-called engineers. No, they are, they are men of culture and they are, they are sensitive, and they are intelligent and uh, very, very accomplished. To become the director of Ove Arup America, God, I mean, you know, and that's what Mahadev was for many years. And Bruce is assistant principal in Los Angeles. So they are very accomplished engineers. And I think we need, it's actually uplifting for architects to see that engineers could be in this way. Yes, it, uh, it is. So I, I feel fortunate that they joined our, our talks, you know. Uh, um, maybe we can do something in the future because these people could, you know, Bruce asked me, did you invite <laughs> Sir Richard Rogers? How could I invite the Sir Richard Rogers? You know, I, I don't have his email address, you know, he's not my friend, but... Uh, <laughs> Maybe he could have invited him. Like when we talked about Goldberg, uh, I did. I had no idea that Bruce actually was friends with his son. He said, "I'll call him right now and tell him to join." But his son was in the forest, you know, uh, having a, a vacation, so he couldn't join our meeting. Anyway, it, it's really a pleasure, and I, I, I actually think. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if, if we could continue in the same way, but such, such afternoons or, or, or evenings, uh, are, are, to me, they are very, fr very fruitful. Uh, you know, I learn new things and I discuss with interesting people and what could be better really to do in the evenings? I don't know, but anyway, many other people don't think so because i sent i sent invitations to many 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 people that is the same deadly indifference well we had a professor here with us uh, mr agent dan nikolai agent and uh, 
uh, still something, but... I saw Mr. Yulis Ionescu for uh, some time. Uh, yeah, I... Yes, yes. That's good, you know. Uh, anyway, we did it, so... Uh, <laughs> And in two or three days, again, we'll see them at least Bruce, because we'll talk about Calatrava. And I know how Bruce are, is, because when we start our meetings, Bruce uh, in Los Angeles is 8 a.m. So in one hour, he starts working at Ove Aru. But I know he, he can't resist. He will be here at 8 a.m. And because, you know, uh, Galatrava concerns him and uh, uh, he concerns also Mahadev, probably. Uh, so we, it's really a joy to have these two engineers. I, 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 I feel inspired by them. Really, it's, it's such a joy to see engineers have such interests and being so sensitive and, and, and uh, considerate. And uh, it's, it's really nice. I don't know. I don't know what you think, but now we we didn't pay homage to Isozaki, but uh, we'll do it. Um, you know, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it is late. Yeah, maybe tomorrow more people will show up, and I could present Arata Isozaki because he is interesting. Arata Isozaki and the so-called schizo schizo eclecticism. This is how he described himself as a schizo eclecticist in a conference I attended at Columbia. Uh, and I even wrote an essay about him. And uh, he got last year, he received the Pritzker Prize. So I think he's an architect uh, worth talking about, just like Sir Richard Rogers, although they are very different. So maybe tomorrow, if you have uh, some free time in the evening, we can meet again and uh, we'll talk about him. And uh, I know a few, uh, also on the day of the Calatrava, uh, you know, birthday will be the, great, the, the, the birthday of a great, great, but very, very modest uh, Swedish architect. And I don't know if you know of him. Maybe Andre knows, or maybe someone else too. Sigurd Leverenz. Sigurd Leverenz was a great architect. He was actually an engineer, and his birthday will be exactly when Calatrava's birthday will be. So it will talk about both. Ah, and then August will come with other, you know, other great birthdays. So really, I, I don't know. I feel inspired, like paying homage to these architects. And I don't feel I'm losing my time, really. I, I feel I learn a lot when I prepare these materials. And again, I invite any one of you, of course, now there are only five people besides me, but any of you, if you want to make a presentation, please do so on any architect. I'll send you the list. And on a specific birthday, you make the presentation. Anyway. So, <laughs> okay, let's say goodbye. I know you are very polite and you don't want to turn your back on me. So I, 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 I tell you, <laughs> have a nice evening and we'll see each other tomorrow. Okay, Vatsal, because you are very loyal. See you, Vatsal. And please eat some good Indian food for me too, please. <laughs> you guys try South Indian, the dosa, uh, that's pretty bland. It's not very spicy. You can try some South Indian restaurant and eat a dosa there. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't get out of the house in uh, four months. So, you know, yeah. Anyway, I'll, maybe I'll prepare myself. If you send me a recipe, a receipt, you know, I'll do it at home somehow. Yeah. Okay, very good. Please write it until tomorrow because I, I, I'm salivating. <laughs> okay, that's all. See you. You, okay, bye. Kenneth, if you are still here, Kenneth, I am saying good evening to you. I mean, I don't know where you are, but maybe good day, I don't know. Ciprian, goodbye. Andre, Mutsumeska, I was present. Goodbye. Shalina, goodbye. Me ha plăcut intervenția ta, Alina.
<laughs> la, bună seara și mulțumesc! Mulțumesc! Și eu. Aveți pentru ce bine! Pe curând! Bună seara! Bună seara!